concerning delegates from across country, continent, and varied academia. A very good evening to one and all. I am Jalashree. And I am Niyati. We feel privileged to welcome you all on behalf of the organizing committee of Nanoland Limited. I thank you all for sparing your precious time and being a part of this international webinar organized by Nanoland Limited and co-organized by Xavier's Research Foundation, LD College of Engineering, University School of Law, Gujarat University, US India Importers Council, Vera and Associates, Circuithon Consulting, Center for Excellence in Environment and Forest Laws, ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad, and Institute of Law, Nirma University. This webinar is sponsored by MQA, Wis Major, Reinzer Aqua, Rotary, Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite, and IP support by HK India. Today, we have gathered to share our knowledge and ideas with our experts from diverse fields on learning, environmental law, principles, and policies of different countries. Now, moving forward, we would like to give a brief about our organizer, co organizers, and sponsors. Nanoland Limited. Nanoland Limited is an eminent research organization based in Ahmedabad. We are mainly focused on climate change, clean energy, and sustainable development. We have a pool of research associates with diverse background affiliated with us who work day and night studying the various parameters of Earth and its component. LD College of Engineering. Lalbhai Dalpatbhai College of Engineering Ahmedabad is a premier government engineering institute in Gujarat set with the objectives of imparting higher education, research, and training in various fields of engineering and technology. The institute is affiliated with Gujarat Technological University Ahmedabad and administered by the Department of Technical Education Government of Gujarat. LD College of Engineering was established on 20th June 1948 as one of the first few engineering colleges in India. Xavier's Research Foundation. The Xavier's Research Foundation Trust runs the Loyola Center for Research and Development, an autonomous institute which was established in the year 1987 in St. Xavier's College, Ahmedabad. Its goal is to do research in science and technology and the humanities. The center not only employs dedicated staff to research, but also provide infrastructure support to expertise to the students working on the frontline research field in environmental microbiology and plant biotechnology. The mission of the center is to target grassroots communities on the fringes of our economy and through innovation, entrepreneurship, training, and handholding, set up production units at medium, small, and micro levels. US India Importers Council is a non-profit initiative started by a group of Indian SME importers responsible for imports of over $1 billion from USA. It is the only exclusive importers council in the world. USIIC acts as an intermediary organization to fa facilitate partnership and trade between Indian and American businesses, thus acting as a catalyst in promoting economic growth between the United States and India. Vera and Associates. Vera and Associates is a, is a Mexican law firm whose members have played an important role in the definition of environmental law practice in Mexico and in other Latin American countries for more than 30 years. Likewise, it has been retained in multiple infrastructure projects in the field of energy, transport, tourism, mining, ho housing, as well as expert witnesses in arbitration, climate change projects, environmental litigation, wildlife protection, and environmental cleanup. Varan Associates has been considered the most important environmental law firm in Mexico by Chambers, Legal 500, Vuzu, Latin Law, etc. The University School of Law, Gujarat University. The University School of Law was established in June 1977. Atrat Lal Hirdar Lal Charity Trust donated for construction of independent building and foundation stone was laid down by Professor Pratap Chandra Chundar, Honorable Minister of Education, Union of, Union of India, on 19th November 1977. In the year of 1982, the school was shifted to its own building. As per the survey conducted by India Today and ORG Group for 2012, the School of Law is ranked first position in Gujarat and 17th position in India to impart legal education. Circuiton Consulting. Circuiton Consulting, based in Glasgow in Scotland, partners with businesses, guiding them through changing legislative environment and enabling them to embed circularity into their products and operations. They help businesses transform into circular businesses built for 21st century and for 21st century customers. Center for Excellence in Environment and Forest Laws, ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad. The ICFI Law School is a significant segment of the ICFI Foundation for Higher Education and recognized by the Bar Council of India. 
The ICFI Law School offers BBA LLB honors, BA LLB honors, integrated five year courses, one year LLM in corporate and commercial laws and tax laws, and full time PhD and other part time programs such as eight certificate courses. ICFI Law School envisions to develop a new cadre of professionals who will not only command a high level of domain proficiency, but also can integrate activities for developing scientific and technological solutions. Institute of Law, Nirma University, founded on the vision of Padma Shri, Dr. Karsan Bhai K. Patel, the Institute of Law, Nirma University, focuses on affairing a bezel shift in the delivery of legal education in the country. It aims to add newer dimension in legal education that would incorporate international standards and provide an environment for innovation and dynamic pursuit of thought. Embodying the principle of justice education, excellence and professionalism, it imparts quality legal education and has produced new generation lawyers, leaders and policymakers over the years. MQA. MQA is a product of this major. This major. Viz Major Eco Private Limited is a prominent entity involved in manufacturing of its various products, like prominent elect electromagnetic water conditioner that helps in softening the water by removing ions that make water hard in most the cases. This Viz Major contained conditioner comes with easy installation, consume less power, and is easily customizable. Ryanzer Aqua. Ryanzer Aqua is one of its type expert in cleaning solar panels automatically easing human efforts, thus increasing the efficiency of the solar, solar panel by cleaning the dust and dirt with cost-effective technique. Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite. The Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite is an active club of the Rotary International Organization, having played important role in various emerging issues and helped to find the solution by serving the society. The club is actually working in various sectors, including environment, education, and women's healthcare development. This club has been serving it since 2010 with the various prominent personalities from the city. We thank and extend our full gratitude and support to the Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite for the noble cause. Thank you once again, our organizer, co-organizers and sponsor for felicitating this event. Now, let us have the pleasure of listening to the opening remarks. May I request Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya, Chief Scientific Advisor at Nanoland to deliver the welcome address. Dr. Acharya is a leading patent attorney. He is a doctorate in science, specifically in chemistry. He is engaged in a lot of research work on climate change and environment. He has consistently guided his research association in speculation past what a normal individual could think. So now, over to you, Dr. Acharya. Hi, environmental caretakers. It is good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we have the speakers and audience all around the globe. Uh, I'm extremely overwhelmed to get this opportunity to address you all. And I'm thankful to each one of you for joining this international, truly international webinar on environmental law, principles and policies of different countries. I take this pleasure to say that this conference has been organized by Nanoland a prominent research organization in the field of climate change, renewable energy, power diversity, and sustainable development. The organization facilitates such webinars to enlighten young minds and promote the participation of the general and scientific audience at all levels. I am compelled by all the speakers and experts from various parts of this world who took out their valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this international webinar. We are honored to have you all with us. On behalf of Nanoland and its organizing committee, I feel proud in welcoming our chief guest of the international webinar, Dr. Madhuri Parekh, director and dean of one of the most renowned institutions. Institute of Law, Nirma University. We are grateful to her for accepting our invitation and becoming a chief guest of today's event. She is known for her wonderful administration and high achievements of the institution she is in charge. Welcome, Dr. Parikh. The motive 
<laughs> the motive to organize today's international webinar is to know the importance of having environmental law, not only in India, but it is in all the nations of the world. Through the medium of this webinar, we will learn the different policies and principles various countries have adapted to safeguard their environment and climate to which we are always. Thing is that we are always talking about the climate change. We are worried a lot about the climate change, environmental problems, pollution. We are talking, we are doing a lot of research, how to protect ourselves. And for this, we require to have better environmental law. And if different countries having different environmental law according to their convenience, it is not okay. We have to make some a uniform environmental law. Because some countries they have different things. Some countries they have different things. And if it is not homogenized, then it is not that. We are talking about the carbon credit and some of the countries have to pay a lot of carbon credit and those countries which are producing a lot of carbon pollution, they are not pay, paying any carbon credits and are paying credit, carbon credit. It doesn't permit pollution maker to make more pollution. It is required to be restricted. So these are first type of such seminar for environmental law at global level. Now let me take this privilege to introduce the eminent speaker from the galaxy of our speakers, Ms. Arjuna Pukhan, who is a lawyer and policy advisor, Help for the World in Cooperation from USA, Mr. Kitrian Ardia, Global Envoy for Natural Based Solution. Country Coordinator for Indonesia and Malaysia, IDA, the Sustainable Trade in in Initiative, Indonesia. We have Dr. Luis Vera Morales, who is a partner of Vera and Associate, Mexico. Ms. Elizabeth Kitari Mitaru, who is a managing partner of Ovolo Advocates Green Brief, Kenya. Ms. Mr. Rian. Stoddart, who is a senior associate of Sir Clothon Consulting Scotland. And we have speaker, Ms. Nozifo Iona Akupe, Environmental and Sustainable Specialist, PPC Cement of South Africa. I would also like to thank Xavier's Research Foundation, LD College of Engineering, USD School of Law, US India Importers Council, Vera and Associate, Sirkuthon Consulting Center for an Excellent in Environment and Forest Laws, ICFAI Law School, Hyderabad, and Institute of Law, Nirma University for co-organizing this event. I'm also thankful to MQA, Waze Measure, Ranger Equa, and Rotary Club Amanda Elite for sponsoring this event, and to HK India for providing IP support. I welcome all of you and let us start enjoying this environmental law. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Your thought provoking welcome address set a perfect platform for our speakers to deliver their presentation in the areas of law pertaining to the environment. Thank you once again, sir. So, may I please welcome our dignitaries on the dais, our honorable chief guest in charge of well-renowned Institute of Law near my university, Dr. Madhuri Parikh. Ms. Archana Fukin, Lawyer and Policy Advisor at Health for the World, Inc. USA. Mr. Fitrian Ardiansha, Global Envoy for Natural Based Solutions Country Coordinator for Indonesia and Malaysia, IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, Indonesia. Dr. Luis Vera Morales, partner Vera and Associates, Mexico. Ms. Elizabeth Gitari Mitaru, managing partner OGO Law Advocates, Green Brief, Kenya. Mr. Ryan Stoddard, senior associate, Circuit Consulting, Scotland. 
Ms. Nozifo Yonan Chope, Environmental and Sustainability, uh, Sustainability Specialist, PPC Cement, South Africa. Thank you everyone for joining us. So let us move forward with our very first speaker of the webinar, Dr. Madhuri Parikh, our Honorable Chief Guest. So uh, now I am very much delighted to welcome our Chief Guest of this international webinar, Dr. Madhuri Parikh. Dr. Parikh has been at, working at the Institute of Law, Nidma University since 2007. Her areas of interest are environmental law, forest law, legal research, and law of thoughts. She is engaged with research activities in the area of environmental and forest law. She has presented papers at national and international conferences and seminars within India and outside India. She has completed two projects funded by Gujarat Econo Ecological Commission on the issues related to the implementation of notification of coastal regulation zone. She has published numerous of papers in reputed journals and is also a recipient of several awards for her research and teaching contribution. She is also a member of International Association of Public Participation. So now I request her to welcome and uh, share her, her presentation or deliver a speech. So, uh, thank you. Uh, huh. uh, th yeah. So for inviting me uh, uh, for the session, and uh, first of all, let me congratulate Nanoland and all the knowledge partners uh, for organizing this event. Uh, I would like to speak uh, briefly about uh, the development of uh, environmental law as such. And uh, I'm very much honored to be with all the expert speakers across the world. And I've seen the theme and the uh, the entire planning of the webinar. Uh, I think it will be really uh, beneficial to the audience. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes to uh, ponder upon some of the issues which we have been facing today. And I will brief you about the little bit uh, about the development of environmental law as such. So <clears throat> if I uh, start with the development of environmental law and uh, where we have reached today, it, it will take us to the journey uh, since the, uh, from the beginning, that is from uh, 1972. So if we look upon the, uh, the development of uh, environmental law at the international level, we can divide it into two, uh, two major periods, three periods rather, a period before 1972, a period from 1972 to uh, 1992, and then the period after 1992. So if we see in, in the last few decades, international environmental law has evolved rapidly as the environmental risks have become more apparent and their assessment and management more complex. In the last few years, we can see that international environmental law has evolved in such a way that it has re reached to almost all uh, uh, and many linkages are there trade and environment, human right and environment. Almost all countries have one or more environmental statutes and the regulation, more than one. So uh, environment is increasingly integrated with economic development, human rights, trade and national security. And uh, if we go back to the period of uh, the beginning of this awareness regarding the uh, environment and the policy framework, that 1972, this was a period, the period before 1972, if we see very little development of uh, environmental law as such, uh, we can say, uh, except the scattered efforts uh, in a form of uh, some treaty or some uh, agreements. Uh, so the period from 1972, we can say it's a period of a basic framework, development of a basic framework related to environment law. So this period begins with 1972 United Nations Conference on Human Environment. And uh, that includes uh, the, uh, the beginning of the uh, awareness regarding the relationship between the economic aspects and the environment. So 1972 was historic because of the first time countries across the world came together to identify and address environmental problems. The United Nations Conference of this 1972 was the first international intergovernmental conference to focus on environmental problems. Uh, perhaps the most central issue that arose in the uh, in this uh, the discussion related to Stockholm Conference was the need to address the potential conflict 
between economic development and environmental protection. Before the conference, uh, conference a small group of experts, uh, they came together and they discussed about uh, the issues related to environment and a kind of conceptual framework was developed. Uh, and it laid down the foundation for later acceptance of the concept of sustainable development. Now, almost each country um, is talking about sustainable development, sustainable approach. Many new principles have been laid down uh, to uh, which, uh, which we may consider as a part of the concept of sustainable development, a precautionary principle, voluntary based principle. And now we are also talking about the inter a generational equity principle that talks about not only the rights of the present generation but also about the future generation. So, if we see the journey from 1972 to 1992, it was a period where the where the world became aware, the states became aware, the nations become aware of the importance of the environment. From 1992 onwards, if we see a gradual development of the the proper legal framework in the uh, in different countries regarding the uh, the uh, environment related regulations then at the global level also uh, we can see the frequency and the speed of uh, signing the agreements uh, we also see the uh, the development of uh, many new things like the uh, our common future our uh, the world uh, the 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 uh, rights related to uh, the uh, you can say the uh, climate and all all these things uh, related to climate related to the uh, role of the stakeholders in decision making process all these are uh, after the rio uh, conference in 1992 and post 1992 if we see uh, the increase in the uh, policy framework uh, but still, uh, I could say that uh, uh, there were some uh, uh, problems related to implementation part. Particularly, we can see a clear cut difference between the developed and developing nations. So, in the developing countries, um, uh, there was a gradually, you can say, the legal, uh, there was a gradual um, increase in the uh, legal framework. Uh, new laws were coming. But again, uh, the implementation was a major issue but still we can see the impact of this global level efforts uh, reflected at the local level i can give a few examples uh, in case of uh, this about india also in india if you talk about 1996 period there are few cases uh, which clearly implemented the principles of uh, precautionary principle polluter based principles uh, it was not part of the legal framework in india but they have been implemented uh, by the judiciary in India. And there are few celebrated cases. Even today, we talk about environment. Uh, these are the first few cases which we will start our discussion with them. The case on uh, case related to Enviro Legal Action versus Union of India, a very famous case of uh, human rights issue, wherein because of the industrial pollution, uh, almost uh, uh, surrounding uh, villages were uh, in a great trouble because of non availability of the potable water. The polluted uh, substances per percolated and uh, it, it, uh, it damaged the, all, all the water resources available in the nearby areas. And the people uh, living in that area, the people staying in that area, uh, their agricultural land, uh, and everything was affected. So this was the issue which was uh, discussed at the local level, no solution found. The matter was reported to the Supreme Court in a form of writ petition. And then um, it has become a, such an issue that even the world has taken note of uh, this issue as a human right issue. So in this particular case, the court uh, did justice with the people. Uh, by applying the polluted waste principle. And it was clearly laid down in this case that those industries which are polluting, they have to pay the cost of uh, environmental restoration and the, uh, to the sufferer. So the earlier concept of uh, just compensating the people through uh, awarding the amount and all, from there to uh, restoration of environment. So not only the, uh, the cost of uh, the damages in legal terms, we say that compensation should be provided. The compensation should not be limited to the people, but it should be uh, a cost should be awarded to a restoration of environment. That has been um, that has come 
through that particular case. Uh, next few cases in the next few years, uh, till 2000, you will find almost this, there are a series of cases wherein the, uh, the principle of international equity, then the, um, uh, the precautionary principles were applied. And the, uh, these are the cases which actually speaks about the uh, global efforts and its reflection at the local level. Now, post uh, this 2000, we see um, uh, there are certain uh, conventions and, and the, um, you can say the efforts made at the, uh, even in the European Union, that Arhas Convention, which talks about rights of the people to participate in the decision making process. So, these are the few later developments uh, which took place after 1992. So, if we see overall these developments from 1972 to present day, we can see that there are many new things which have come out in the field of uh, policy framework and the implementation one is that the rights on the part of the, uh, the rights of the people then the uh, duties of the people duties of the state in uh, in uh, the the funda one minute <coughs> one minute uh, the duties on the part of the state the duties on the part of the citizens uh, then again uh, we may discuss about uh, the the right to information of the people. So when the people should get the one minute. If we talk about the rights of the state, the rights of the people. So what 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 in see the the principle of public trust doctrine, which was also implemented in India, and it it is also part of the concept of sustainable development. So if we see that, we can see that. That the state is uh, under the duty. The state is under is the is not the owner of the resources, but is a trustee. The concept of uh, the trusteeship and the people are the beneficiary, real beneficiary. So um, this concept is also evolved uh, uh, after the Rio Conference. So these are the uh, you can say we can see reflections of this international efforts at the at the local level. Still, there are some areas wherein we need to work. One is that, uh, particularly, I'm talking from the point of view of the developing nations. One area is uh, the area of involving the people in the decision making process. Now, if we make the comparative analysis of the developed countries and the de uh, de developed and the developing nations, some of the things even the developing countries have to learn from the developed nations. One is that empowering the people to participate in the decision making process. So now the uh, the matter related to policy framework and environment is not only uh, it, it has not remained limited only to the implementing authority or the state um, and uh, only the re regulatory mechanism, but it has also uh, come as a duty on the part of the citizens to obey, to to follow these rules, regulations, and to to participate in the implementation process. Again, to participate. Uh, in giving suggestions for a battery implementation and again to participate in the decision making process that those projects which are not environmentally viable, not uh, favorable to the local situation, to the people or to from the point of view of environment. At the time of environment impact assessment or social impact assessment, people do have a right to participate in the decision making process. So from uh, the state uh, taking initiative uh, to uh, local level and now the people should take the initiative to this level the development uh, uh, has been made so we can see the the gradual development of this law and policy framework uh, and its uh, implementation at the local level now at present we are facing the issues of climate change and in climate change again the role of the people is very important so the people can play very important role from two point of view. One, uh, by participating in the decision making process and then uh, taking initiative uh, in a form that when they give suggestions, certain concrete decisions they will have to take and certain steps they will have to take so that by the time of framing the policy also, the policies can be framed in such a way that with the least environmental harm and the least harm to the society, it can be taken. So, as a pressure group or as a uh, uh, participatory uh, in a participatory process, like as a stakeholders in the decision making process, at both the ways they can uh, participate. So, now the time has come when the people have to play a very important role. 
and particularly if we talk about developing nations some behavioral changes is, are also required uh, not only developing even the developed nations so now we have to learn a kind of a we have to develop a habits wherein we can with a minimal use of uh, you can say with a, with a minimum harm to the environment we have to find out the alternatives that is one thing second uh, so again at the time of uh, conclusion i would like to conclude in by saying these three things that again now the role of people is very crucial in the um, uh, sustainable approach that we follow and protecting our resources for the future generation two things are very essential one by changing our habits uh, we have to adopt a kind of a, a kind of a, a system wherein we can with a minimum harm uh, we can uh, uh, do our routine i mean to say that uh, the re the resources that we are using we have to uh, uh, change our behavior so that we can put less less, less pressure on the resources second thing is that uh, as a aware citizen taking part in the decision making process and giving concrete suggestions whenever the suggestions are invited or sometimes as a representative of the people uh, taking a leader leading role and uh, uh, making impact on the decision making process uh, on the part of the state so yeah. I, I cannot do justice with the theme in this short time with particularly regarding the decision making part how people can play important role but there is a scope even in the environment impact assessment process and at many other processes wherein people have a role to play uh, and to give suggestions so at that time also if effective participation can take place a uh, number of things can be changed and i hope that uh, we will be having uh, many new perspectives in this session um, because we have a very uh, very expert speakers from all across the world uh, and i will be very happy to hear them and i hope that um, a new perspective will emerge out from this uh, from this discussion thank you thank you for giving me opportunity thank you ma'am for gracing our event and sparing your valuable time for us now let's move on with our next speaker, Ms. Archana Fukan. Archana is a qualified attorney from India. She has completed her master's in environmental law from the University of Sussex, UK, and her undergraduate studies in law from National Law University and Judicial Academy, Assam. Her past experiences include, in the, include working in the corporate environment and healthcare sectors. Currently, she's working as a legal specialist with a healthcare organization based out of California. She also volunteers for environmental protection organization and arranges workshops and field visits for children and the youth. Arjuna's main interest lies in environmental law, sustainability issues, and gender-related aspects of climate change. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Marjorie, for giving us such a beautiful um, overview of environmental law, its history. And I couldn't agree with Dr. Rajesh Kumar more because he has actually said that we are here today, all the environmental educators. I can see a lot of participants from all over the world. I could see people logging in from Afghanistan, from northeastern part of India. And I could also see some people logging in from, um, I think, Kenya as well. So yeah, that was really nice. And thanks a lot, Jalshri and Niyati, for the beautiful introduction. So it was really nice. I'll be talking about international environmental law and the global south addressing climate change. So we all know international environmental law and climate change are like a part and parcel of each other. So when we talk about international environmental law, the main thing that comes up right now in our mind is climate change with the ongoing conference of the parties in Glasgow right now. But before I move on to what the whole aspect is all about i would like to introduce everybody to the topics that i'll be discussing here first i'll be discussing what comprises of the global south the role played by international law in addressing environmental issues the complexities and whether international environmental law as a whole is sufficient to address these issues the current shift in the law from treaty making to treaty implementation and the current regimes in place with regard to climate change. We'll be also discussing about climate litigation. And finally, we'll also be discussing about international environmental law as an instrument of environmental justice. So moving on to my next slide, what is meant by Global South? 
So when we talk about global South, there is no specific definition. It has always come up from different scholars from different parts of the world. So first we actually hear about it by this French demographer called Alfred Sauvy, called, when he used the term tears mourn. My French pronunciation might not be that correct, but this is how I Googled it and that's how they pronounce it. So which means third world, which is like different from what the first world and second world countries he was referring to. It's basically the economic disparities between the different countries all over the world and how it has been segregated in an economical manner. Then we talk, we also uh, know about Mickelson, who is a very famous international lawyer and he's actually a scholar and who has used the third world quite repetitively in his texts. And he also used the terms less developed, developing, underdeveloped, specifically the term the, called the South. Also, we find a lot of third world approaches to international law scholars in, uh, from third world countries. And uh, like, for example, D.S. Chimney, we talk about Usha Natarajan. So these people have contributed a lot to the idea of global South in international law most of the time. Then we come across the term Global South in a Brand Commission report, which was by Willie Brand, where he was, he was an economist and he tried to actually give an idea about what the environmental and economic disparities are between countries which are economically progressive and there are countries that are not economically at par with the rest of the world. And in the meantime, we come across a lot of, um, let's say, independent journalists, writers, activists, then sub-state actors, non-state actors who use the term Global South, where, you know, they refer to the middle-income countries located in Africa, Asia, Oceania, Latin America, and the Caribbean. I hope I have given some picture about what the Global South entails, and we'll be for further discussing about international environmental law here. So now we'll talk about uh, the role of international environmental law in addressing environmental issues. So first of all, we'll have to understand that it's a very complex matter that we are dealing with because of the difference in economic growth, difference in geography, difference in the availability of natural resources all over the world. We cannot just pick one country A and country B and merge it together and make something you know that is going to be equal for both the countries. So we always had the debate and the question about environmental degradation, nature conservation, optimal use of resources. And like uh, Dr. Madhuri said that in 1972, we came up with something very formal in terms of environmental law, like the Stockholm Declaration, which is very famous for the use of the term sustainable development where people came together countries came together to decide that we are going to use the resources in such a way that it doesn't compromise the resources of the future generation so this is the first time where we strike the conversation about sustainability then we moved on to different protocols like the montreal protocol which we all must have heard which is one of the famous conventions but when the Montreal Protocol was actually happening, there were other countries whose issues were completely different. Like a lot of countries with high economy, they were concerned about the ozone depleting substances because of which the Montreal Protocol is in place. But there were countries which were also talking about removing the poverty, getting better uh, safe drinking water, getting access to clean energy, removing gender inequality and so on. So especially when we look into the whole um, Rio declarations in 1992 and Stockholm declaration, there are a lot of things which are, for example, the Brazilian delegation, the head of the Brazilian delegation pointed out, the president of Sudan, uh, who was, um, his name was Gafar Nimeri at that time, and prime minister of India, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, even she pointed out like, Countries like Sudan, India, Brazil are still dealing with issues like shelter, water, and poverty. So we were not in the position in 1987 to think about ozone depleting substances. So after that, a whole idea came up, uh, came up like the Rio Declaration in 1992, 
where countries were convinced that yes, the whole environmental aspect is a global problem, a common problem, and how do we get everybody on board together? Then we came up with principles like common but differentiated responsibilities. Common but differentiated responsibilities, which meant your goal is common, that is to protect the environment, but your responsibilities are going to differ. Countries like the first world countries are going to have a different type of commitment and countries from the global south are going to have a different type of commitment. And slowly, slowly, we see a shift where the developing states continue to emphasize that their environmental issues are very different from the developed nations. If you have any questions, just pause and ask me. I can, I'm very happy to answer them in between as well. Moving on with my next slide. Uh, it's the climate change I I just because of the time restraint I just picked up one topic which is a very burning topic in environmental law right now that is climate change where we see a shift from treaty making to treaty implementation now the first point which I have actually pointed out is the Stockholm declaration way back in 1972 these are all very soft laws like we have some ways to put them in our national regime like for example the indian constitution also through a particular article i'm sorry i don't remember the article exactly but through that article it allows us to make domestic legislations based on the international law so we had some ways of getting things done but it was never a legally binding instrument so now after that we have the paris we have the paris agreement to this day like which is one of the most important agreements uh, out of all the conference of parties so it was uh, signed in cop 21 and the paris agreement of 2015 talks about carbon emissions carbon credits which which was for the first time discussed in international law so there was a lot of emphasis which was given on financial assistance and technological transfer to like technological assistance to developing nations like green technology and you know if a first world country has a patent of a green technology there was some kind of a fair use being given to countries from the global south to use this green technology and to deal with the climate change issues that they are facing then we have the nationally determined contributions in paris agreement where countries were actually made accountable uh, by way of putting forward a document from each of the country the the representative would come and give this contrib like put forward these contributions and tell that their respective country has decided to do this with regards to climate change and its adverse effects so every year when the conference of parties are held countries are questioned countries are held accountable and at the same time for all the determined contributions to be like implemented and monitored at the same time there are monitoring committees and i think we very recently last year in 2020 december we have the paris agreement monitoring com committee where people are there there's a bench where people are going to monitor about the correct implementation of the nationally determined contributions of different countries. Then we have strengthening support mechanisms. mechanisms. We have different type of funds going on. We have a big corporates, like the corporate social responsibility aspects where, where corporates are trying to support us SDGs. And I couldn't agree with Dr. Rajesh Acharya more here because he said we cannot have a carbon fund and let everyone buy the carbon credits and uh pollute the uh, atmosphere at the same time so it's a very very debatable thing and i think i would love to discuss more about this at some point and yeah next we have transparency and review mechanisms and a lot a lot of participation by the non-state actors we see a lot of ngos civil society organizations that are like continuously trying to create a debate create a lot of change make a difference when it comes to climate change especially there are a lot of scholars a lot of people from the global south they are questioning the people who have already progressed economically and they are held, counting them respond like they are held responsible for these kind of um, issues that you know climate change is not just caused by uh, one particular country but people but, but by countries where most of the most of them are economically progressive 
coming back to climate litigation, we see a lot of countries having their own courts and tribunals. Like, for example, um, I wrote a few of them. We see the Environmental Dispute Coordination Commission of Japan, uh, Environment and Land Tribunals of Ontario, Canada. We see the National Green Tribunal in India. We see the United States Environmental Protection Agency's Environment Appeal Board. So there are a lot of institutions within the countries to uh, take forward litigation, environmental issues, but there are very few cases when we talk about climate change. The question has always remained, when will there be a legal formal institution like the International Court of Justice? We have International Criminal Court, we have the World Trade Organization, we have we have courts to deal with trade disputes. We have courts to deal with uh, different um, criminal cases, but nobody has actually come up with, uh, the world has not come up with something like the International Court for the Environment. So a lot of question has been going on because climate change is happening very fast and we really, really need to act on it. And as a lawyer, I personally feel that if countries can help other countries accountable for the pollution, for um, the you know, different kind of mismanagement. I think that would be a great way to start with uh, tackling climate change. I have actually pointed out the pulp mills case here, which is not exactly related to climate change, but because ICJ was in a very tough spot here to decide on the basis of the environment, and it didn't come up with something standard. It didn't have like a standard precedence to said that, you know, this is the standard for environmental impact assessment. So it basically told both the countries, Uruguay and Argentina, when it, like Uruguay was a party to it where it had the pulp mills and they were polluting the river, which was actually moving to Argentina. And since there was no standard environmental impact assessment internationally, the, the, the judge actually said, you have to follow your own country's environmental impact assessment. And there was nothing on the forefront when it came to actual environmental justice. Moving on to my final slide, where I'm just leaving it open like a food for thought for everyone uh, about international environmental law as an instrument for environmental justice. So the question is, is ICJ enough for dealing with environmental law cases when we already have criminal courts, I, the courts for arbitration and World Trade Organization? Then treaty implementation also requires a redressal mechanism when it uh, comes to environmental justice in the future, like I said, uh, institution for environmental law so that countries can be held accountable for their response for their mismanagement for whatever wrong they have done governments to be held accountable for all their wrongdoings then we have uh, environmental inequality like i said is real and hardest hit countries are the ones with poor economy because we don't have the technology we don't have the mechanism to deal with climate change and as we all know like the un has set out a study and the statistics say that women and children are the most affected here and like from my personal experience, I was doing a field survey back in the state of Assam one, at one point due to climate change and the annual floods, which we know of every year, but is very like, you know, it is not being shown in the media much, but the state of Assam actually faces floods every year. And the worst thing which I have seen why women and children are the, uh, are the most affected is because men knew how to swim. They could swim and they were able to go and survive to a higher like they could swim towards a higher area but women did not know how to swim and a lot of women eventually die so these are like very uh, basic things which we actually kind of neglect but these are so important like the climate change is happening it's real and how women and children are actually directly and highly affected and i think we need to talk more about it think more about it question more about it so that we can actually come up with the solutions and it's not a single problem, it's a pr problem for the entire world. So yeah, that's that's about it for me and uh, climate change is happening fast and we as lawyers know that it has the potential to act as an instrument for social justice. Thank you, thank you so much. And that would be my email ID. If you have any questions, you want to ask anything about this 
please feel free to email and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fukan. It was surely an exceptional presentation. Now let's move on to our next presentation. So let me introduce you all our next speaker of the session, Mr. Fitrian Adiensha. Mr. Fitrian Adiensha is a global envoy for nature-based solutions for IDH Sustainable Trade Initiative. He is also executive chairman and founder of Yayasan IDH in Indonesia and country representative of IDH Sustainable Trade Initiative in Malaysia. He has more than 22 years working experience in the field of ecological and environmental economics natural resource management, integrated special and land use planning, sustainable commodities, sustainable forest management, as well as climate change and climate energy. His geographical coverage of works include areas inside Indonesia, Australia and Asia Pacific. So now I request him to present his views with us. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jalashi. Uh, thank you also, um, Dr. Rajesh. Uh, Dr. Maduri and also uh, distinguished colleagues uh, and panelists, including the previous speaker, Ms. Archana. I think uh, uh, I would like to say uh, how grateful I am uh, to be invited uh, again uh, to this uh, very important uh, event and webinar. Um, we have heard uh, from our uh, distinguished speakers before <clears throat> about the importance of uh, environmental laws um, Dr. Maduri and also uh, Ms. Archana, for instance, uh, mentions about uh, the importance of global environmental laws, uh, starting from you know um, even '72, the 1972, and then of course '92, uh, uh, the Rio, uh, the, the the original Rio, uh, and of course uh, nowadays uh, we are still expecting something coming out, hopefully uh, strongly uh, from. Uh, uh, Glasgow. Uh, I hope uh, Ryan uh, from Scotland can can share. Uh, uh, but uh, without further ado, I would like to um, take you uh, directly to uh, what I call a uh, reality check uh, when it comes to environmental regulations, uh, laws, and policies uh, in the context of developing countries. Uh, in this case, uh, in in Indonesia, it's a uh, Challenging to pick and choose uh, certain countries, uh, but I would like to share with you the uh, experience as well as perhaps some case studies coming from Indonesia. So the interesting part uh, from Indonesia, I would say that uh, even before uh, the discussions and uh, talking and, and dialogues about sustainable development, environmental issues, starting from the 70s, uh, when uh, Indonesia uh, got our own independence. Uh, one of the uh, interesting part of uh, the national anthem that we have is the fact that in our national anthem, uh, we said uh, quite uh, strongly and eloquently about Indonesia Tana uh, Airku uh, in, 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 in this regard, if we translate it in, in, uh, into English, it is called Indonesia, uh, our homeland or my homeland. And then the homeland, if you distinguish uh, the two words, uh, tanah and air, it means land and so uh, when it comes to environment, when it comes to natural resources, uh, be it agri agriculture, uh, be it from forests and marine and so on and so forth, it has already been reflected in our national anthem. And also because uh, the fact that we live in archipelagic nations, uh, I mean, many people and also many parties, uh, many sectors in Indonesia realize that we have to, we, we, we can't do things without depending on environmental protections or managing our nature resources better. And uh, it is also then reflected in our own constitutions, especially in the Article 33. Um, we, uh, in this in this constitution, so we, had, uh, we have, uh, the article saying that, of course, all the natural resources need to be managed uh, as uh, good uh, and as responsible as possible for the benefit of many uh, Indonesian uh, populations or Indonesian citizens. But it has to lead to uh, it has to lead to uh, the creation of equitable and welfare societies, and the natural resources need to be managed responsibly. So I think when it comes to uh, you know countries developing countries like indonesia and i believe also in different uh, developing countries as mentioned by archana before the global south 
um, uh, these countries, uh, especially in the constitution, most of the time they have already reflected the, the needs for good environmental uh, management and also natural resources management. But of course, like uh, Dr. Maduri uh, has mentioned perfectly and eloquently in the beginning, uh, the global uh, dialogues, the global discussion, the global debates and discourse also uh, have influenced uh, Indonesian uh, and Indonesia's development in, in the context of environmental and natural resources law. And of course, uh, recently uh, climate change law uh, we heard about, uh, you know, the UNCSD, uh, the Rio in uh, 1992, uh, and of course UNFCCC, uh, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. In fact, Indonesia uh, hosted uh, in uh, 2007 uh, in Bali uh, the COP13. I was involved as well as part of the Indonesian delegates uh, at that time, uh, and of course the biodiversity, uh, UNCBD and many different things that uh, these uh, different elements of uh, global dialogues, uh, global discussions, uh, soft laws, uh, or whatever, have already influenced and, and pushed uh, the development of uh, national laws and policies in, in Indonesia to be then uh, absorbing and also incorporating this by ratific uh, ratifying <coughs> uh, different type of elements uh, from this type of global laws, but also inserting and embedding uh, those elements even further and translating that into technical regulations as well as uh, many different uh, action plan, for instance. Uh, the, the recent ones, uh, it's about plastic and marine debris. I think that's quite important uh, when it comes to uh, archipelagic nation like Indonesia. So just to uh, take you to some of the key um, uh, environmental and natural resources or climate change laws and regulations, uh, there are so many, uh, but uh, there are at least three or four uh, key uh, environmental laws or environmental related laws that uh, I think it would be uh, important to be uh, uh, shared with you. Of course, uh, law number 32, 2009, in which it, it was specific uh, development issues uh, to focus on the management and protections of the environment. Uh, uh, people uh, consider this as uh, a comprehensive environmental law. Uh, not only uh, uh, regulating environmental protections, but uh, many different comprehensive aspects in which in the past it was like um, uh, um, uh, drafted or de developed in a different uh, type of regulation. So from EIA, for instance, environmental impact assessment, um, uh, management of the uh, you know, uh, particular um, areas, uh, and of course the hazardous waste and, and so on and so forth, it is part of this kind of law. Uh, I will uh, come back to also the new law that we have uh, uh, issued and, and developed and issued uh, last year, which is, uh, we call it the job creation law or omnibus law, uh, but I'll, I'll get back to uh, uh, that later. Uh, and also um, after the fall of Suharto, uh, some of you may uh, have known that uh, we were under a di dictatorship uh, for about 32 something years. So Suharto, uh, former general, um, uh, was our president at the time. And then when Suharto fell, Indonesia then went uh, straight forward from really central government type of uh, structure into decentralized type of governments. So since then, in I think 2001, uh, Indonesia has uh, adopted uh, what we call uh, decentralized regional type of government. So low uh, uh, focusing on uh, regional governments uh, is also important and in fact uh, some of the components or elements of environmental protections and uh, as well as natural resource uh, management are part of this kind of law so uh, you can see also then it has created some sort of uh, good ways or good positive uh, momentums for uh, local people to manage their own natural resources but also it has created confusion and also contradictions between the national government type of uh, directions and also provincial and district uh, government type of direction and management. Uh, it's quite interesting also to focus on this. Uh, it's not only about enforcing it, but even uh, at different layers, sometimes you have this kind of uh, contradictions. And of course, law <clears throat> number 41 and 1999 on forestry, it is quite important because Indonesia, I think uh, the third uh, largest uh, uh, tropical forests uh, nations in the world uh, after Brazil and Congo. Uh, and it is quite important to see, especially in Glasgow, in which uh, forest uh, is considered as one of the uh, key contributions to managing and also addressing uh, climate change. So 
in the context of forestry law uh, in 1999, uh, Indonesia has this kind of law to not only uh, push uh, for production, but also conversion and also conservation, protection and restorations. It looks like a comprehensive, but if you look at the element of this law or different elements uh, in this law, you, you tend also to see some sort of uh, contradictions or potential contradiction in which uh, some uh, uh, mandates are given for uh, pushing for productions and conversions from forest to uh, other land uses, for instance, for agriculture, but uh, some uh, directions are given for you know, strong protection, strong conservation, and of course, eventually restorations. Uh, but since uh, last year, um, just to give you also a, a good um, idea, the Indonesia, especially uh, the parliament, uh, with the backup of the executive uh, uh, element uh, at the national uh, government, uh, they, they try to combine or to compile different type of laws that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes uh, having this kind of contradictions. Uh, then pull it together and then uh, assess uh, this uh, and uh, assess different uh, components of this law and then they compile this and then they issue a, a, a very what we call a, a, a strong law in which uh, all uh, the uh, dimensions ele elements of different laws are part of this uh, they call it uh, the job creation law but uh, many uh, or the public uh, know, know this as the omnibus law in which that environment, uh, productions, uh, different sectors uh, are part of this. I think the idea is that uh, the government would like to, uh, you know, uh, diminish or uh, uh, shortcut or shorten the bureaucracy and different type of uh, dimensions of uh, laws uh, which has created confusions uh, in the past. But we have to see whether this uh, would reduce um, uh, the effectiveness of the environmental protections and of course enforcement of the environmental protections or it has uh, or it will uh, provide uh, a, a stronger uh, elements to uh, push forward for environmental protection uh, i think uh, the time will tell and of course uh, under the laws there are plenty of uh, uh, policy that the government at the national level has created uh, i think one of the key elements uh, recently of course uh, climate change related policies in which NDC, the nationally uh, determined Con contribution of Indonesia, uh, has put forward or has been put forward, uh, you know, 29% of uh, emission uh, reduction target by 2030. I think uh, in Glasgow, uh, just recently, the president also announced uh, Indonesia, uh, Indonesia's pledge uh, to become uh, net for losing, uh, net uh, forest and other land use uh, sink by 2030 and perhaps uh, net zero emissions by 2060. So this is quite uh, uh, strong uh, coming from uh, a developing country like in, in Indonesia. And if, I think the, the challenging part would be uh, to translate this into different sectors. And of course, uh, several different uh, stronger elements of um, uh, laws related to environmental protections uh, can be related to uh, the fact of the climate change uh, debates and discussions uh, at the global level. The presidential instructions uh, in 2015, for instance, as you can see, has created this kind of uh, moratorium or the halt of uh, the expansions of uh, new licenses uh, to open up or to convert forests and people. And so this has created also a momentum for uh, forest in Indonesia to breed. And uh, this has also helped, uh, as uh, we can see uh, uh, in the past five years, the reductions, uh, significant reductions of deforestation in Indonesia. And also it has been combined by the uh, uh, another uh, presidential instructions uh, of moratorium for the expansion of palm oil license. So this kind of combinations, uh, I think we have to see whether this would be continued. Uh, with the omnibus law and also with different policies uh, since, let's say, 2022. Uh, but uh, by, I mean, uh, seeing Indonesia as the leader of G the G20, I think Indonesia would like also to show that they are uh, trying still to lead the way in terms of environmental protections. Energy uh, elements also <clears throat> uh, are important, but this is still uh, lagging behind compared to, for to forestry and uh, land use in the context of Indonesia. Just to give you a background of <clears throat> what I mentioned about the national type of uh, laws and regulation and also the subnational uh, law and regulation. Of course, uh, any uh, subnational uh, policy law and regulation needs to then follow uh, the national law and uh, policy. 
but sometimes <coughs> uh, it has created, like I mentioned earlier, some sort of confusion and also contradictions. Uh, because uh, uh, the provincial governments, the district government, the local governments are being asked by the national government, of course, to uh, generate some sort of income and revenue. That's why it is important now. Um, I mean, the work of uh, different organizations with the provincial and subnational government to develop what, what so-called green growth policy and plan and budget, and then translating this in their uh, you know program or annual program, as well as translating it in, into also uh, the investment plan of uh, the provincial and also uh, local governments uh, with the support of the private sector. Because without that law uh, would still be uh, perceived as something that a document that uh, would be put uh, in the bookshelf. So this is something that I think uh, would be crucial. I mean, uh, the national law is one thing, but the provincial and the district or the local government's uh, law and regulation would be so crucial in ensuring that uh, environmental protection, nature resource management can be done in a responsible way. I just uh, uh, give you some brief uh, examples. I mean, this has been done, I think, in several different provinces in which green growth policies uh, have been developed uh, in those provinces and then uh, internalized or uh, integrated into midterm development planning and also, uh, more importantly, budgeting. Uh, one of the key uh, lessons learned that uh, I personally and also many uh, experts and also many uh, you know leaders in Indonesia uh, have uh, experienced uh, is the fact that if we talk about laws, regulations, and policy, we shouldn't distinguish or we shouldn't de detach this with the discussion of fiscal and budget. Why? Because yeah, laws can be great in terms of wording and so on and so forth, but there, if there's no budget attached to that, there won't be any operationalization or execution and in fact enforcement of that kind of law. I think that's a, a quite clear uh, lesson learned that we we have uh, in the context of Indonesia. I hope uh, in other countries it will be also the same. Uh, just to give you also an example, and this is uh, one province in Sumatra. It is called Jambi. Uh, for instance, land legality uh, is important, of course, not only for uh, because it is mandated by the law, but without land legality, farmers cannot cultivate sustainably. But because there's no budget attached to that, farmers cannot have that kind of land legality process. That is why now uh, the district government, the provincial government set up or allocate some sort of budget with the support of the private sector uh, to accelerate this kind of land legality. It is also uh, similar in West Kalimantan, in Borneo, in which you have this kind of laws, uh, forestry laws, saying that you have to protect uh, forests and high conservation values. But you have plantation law uh, stating that uh, you have to cultivate, uh, you know, crops, and then because of that, you have that kind of conflicts. That kind of facilitations of different laws not only uh, are needed at the national level, but also uh, are needed in at the provincial level and also local level. So you can have a really, really comprehensive and also convergence you know, when it comes in, uh, when it comes to environmental protection and nature resource management. Uh, last but not least, in 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 our view, is that um, again. Um, there are now um, environmental, natural resource management, or climate change laws discussed uh, in different sectors. But also, you have the banking and financial institutions having also this kind of push for sustainable finance. Uh, luckily, in Indonesia, we got what we call OJK, uh, the Authority of Financial Services, also delivering as well as pushing forward for this kind of sustainable financing. And because of that, because they are um, uh, administering and also overseeing uh, banks and uh, financial institutions in Indonesia, they are, they are and they can push uh, the banks and financial institutions uh, not only to put forward uh, sustainable finance, but also put investment screening and so on and so forth as part of their uh, procedures. So it's, it's not only EIA per projects, but also banks are now uh, are being asked to uh, be equipped uh, to also support environmental protection. It is still early days, but I think it's, it's going to be good to see whether this is going to lead for uh, positive impacts in, in, in the past. This is just some example of investment related to sustainability and sustainable commodity and sustainable finance uh, at uh, you know, a really large level, but also translated at local level. Uh, um, uh, some previous speakers already mentioned about uh, the climate change law. I think the challenging part for different uh, developing countries, including Indonesia, is that there's so many different things uh, outside there, the compliance market, the voluntary carbon standard, climate change mitigation and adaptations. I think people uh, tend to get confused. 
So linking these uh, discussions or debate at the global level and translating them into the country, but also on the ground would be so crucial, especially because you have interest coming from the private sector, financial institutions, uh, different countries, donor countries, and so on and so forth. So I would say um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, we need to see whether laws uh, when it comes to environmental management, natural resource management, uh, protection, and so on and so forth can uh, be then uh, adopted and then of course executed and enforced not only at the national level but effectively also can be uh, enforced uh, on the ground uh, at local level but this in, in our view uh, based on our lesson learned should and uh, have to also be attached or associated with the discussion of fiscal and budget otherwise there won't be any executions and uh, monitoring and also safeguarding of this kind of thing thank you so much uh, and uh, i hope uh, there's uh, so many different questions so we can discuss further over to you Thank you, Mr. Adiansha, for giving your valuable insights. And we'll be having an interactive question and answer session at the end of the webinar. Now let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Luis Vera Morales, a pioneer in Mexican environmental law and practice. Vera and Associates founding partner, Luis Vera received his law degree from the Escuela Libre de Derocho in Mexico City. In 2010, he received a doctorate in Environment and Sustainable Development from Instituto Politecnico Nacional in Mexico City. He represents Mexico at the Latin American Science and Technology Development Program. He's a member of the board of the Mexico-US Commission for Educational and Cultural Exchange and secretary of the Fulbright Alumni Association in Mexico. In Mexico and abroad, he serves as a coordinator and instructor in various graduate studies programs in environmental policy, management and law. He was invited as executive director of the National Agency for the Hydrocarbon Sector by the current president, Lopez Obrador. Over to you, Dr. Morales. Hello, hi, how are you? Um, first, I want to thank Nanoland for, for the invitation and uh, uh, Dr. Acharya and uh, of course, Ganesh Kanoya that has been helping us to, to, to be with, with all you all of you in this in this event. Thank you so much. And I salute my, my fellow colleagues and and speakers. So uh, I have a presentation. Hopefully we can we, we can put it. Uh, uh, this is something I, I, I urge the the participants uh, to um, to follow me, this following this this these next minutes. I think we have we have something very important to share, something that might be uh, seen as as uh, advanced even for our, for a country like uh, that Mexico with so many problems. But uh, I, I think uh, uh, we can we can uh, we can we can share some some of our experience. Uh, can we put the, the presentation? Uh, the map of Mexico uh, just located below uh, uh, the U.S. and north of Central America. Uh, please, uh, the, next, the next one. Okay, well, first let me tell you that uh, we are celebrating 50 years of the first environmental law in Mexico, you see, uh, which is of 1971. And uh, since then we have evolved in reach and complexity you know, in, in terms of our laws and regulations. One thing to say there is that um, for many years we followed the example of the US because it made sense for us as as uh, as uh, as partners in uh, and, and 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 the closeness in the geographic uh, uh, situation that we have with them. So uh, uh, for the following years, when they had a law on waters, we have regulations on water. When they had a laws on air, we we also had our regulations on air, etc. No, and that happened for a long time. And. Uh, um, uh, if we if we follow how we have advanced, we had first a, a 1971 law that was devoted to control of pollutants that affected the health of humans. No, it was very focused on uh, on an air pollution, water pollution in the cities. No? Uh, then in 1982, the, the, the pollutant control ma uh, was maintained. Plus, there were some uh, other aspects related to protection of ecosystems. Then the 1988 law that is now the, the, the general law of ecological equilibrium that is still in place uh, established, established principles, instruments, 
um, uh, more refined uh, 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 provisions on pollution control, protection of ecosystems. The environmental issue passed from being a feral, a feral matter to one where federation, the states and the municipalities all had a part in regulating and protecting the environment. And also uh, uh, the public participation and the access to information, broad access information, the broadest that, uh, that we had at the time came from environmental law and um, it was regulated and then ensured by the, by the, by the administrative and the judicial courts. Since then, since, that, since the publication of that law, we began to work on legislation, general legislation, that means legislation that, that would uh, entail federation states and municipalities on specific matters such as water, waste, forestry, wildlife, climate change, biodiversity, energy transition, and, 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 and a lot more others. And also, we put environmental, you know, we, we, in, in other laws that were not specifically related to environment, we introduced environmental concerns and obligations in, in, in uh, uh, laws such as mining, energy, oil and gas and electricity, sustainable agriculture, tourism, uh, uh, health, etc., fiscal uh, 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 and tax uh, uh, legislation, all of those have a, 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 a part of, of environmental concerns uh, uh, within the provisions. Finally, uh, we have in place civil, administrative, criminal, and uh, uh, an ad hoc environmental liability with sound and independent logics as part of, of everyday transaction. This is a part of everyday work in Mexico, this kind of, 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 uh, of liabilities and responsibilities. Next one, please. Well, the sources, uh, we, were, we were invited here to talk about the principles, and this is why it was so important for me to, to, to participate, because as you will see, the, the fact that we embraced principles have, have uh, uh, taken us to another level. Um, our rights and principles are embedded in the Mexican constitution, of course. We have uh, in the rights to equal protection, to a healthy environment, to economic development with the conservation of the resources, to the protection of indigenous resor uh, territories, resources, and customs, access to information to ensure effective participation, and access to justice and reparation of damage. Um, the rights and principles and obligations included in international treaties and conventions are also law of the land and have begun to be considered and complied with in policy as well as in decision-making processes, like uh, Rio or, or the Convention on Biological Diversity, the International Water Shells, uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, conventions, persistent pollutants, wildlife trafficking, ILOS Convention 169 on participation of indigenous communities, the Escazú Accord, and on, among many others. And uh, um, of course, we have now fully developed federal, state, and municipal legislation. Uh, uh, almost all of the, of the 2,000 municipalities in Mexico have uh, uh, environmental uh, legislation. The 32 states have their own uh, legislation and, and uh, authorities and uh, authority generals for the environment. And then we have a strong set of judicial precedents and decisions. Next one, please. This is our new reality, and this is the part that I think is very important. Uh, uh, listening to, to, to Dr. Uh, uh, Acharya uh, uh, and, and, and to my, my uh, uh, the, 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 the prior speakers, uh, I think that this is relevant. Mexico has signed all of the international agreements related to the environment that, are, that could be signed. No? 84 uh, binding agreements that, that, that by them represent hard law, applicable by themselves and 29 non-binding uh, agreements or, or treaties, uh, which are considered soft law. That means that they require implementation through internal legislation. And uh, hierarchically, since the, since the inception of the constitution in 1917, uh, all these agreements and, and, and treaties were always below the constitutional principles. They could not go beyond the constitution. The past 10 years have, have proven a revolution in Mexico because uh, there was a, a, a momentous decision by the legislation, uh, the, 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 the legislative branch, to reform Article 1st 
second paragraph of the Mexican Constitution, which now forces all the Mexican authorities, uh, uh, judicial, uh, 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 legislative, and administrative, to interpret the law and to, and to draft the laws in conformance not only with the Constitution, but with the international treaties where human rights are involved. No? And this includes the access to health environment. So through that uh, modification, it, uh, it granted uh, the broadest protection to individuals as uh, well as to uh, the communities where those individuals uh, belong. This is called uh, the expanded pro homine principle. No? Now in Mexico, all international treaties and conventions are not only mandatory, but if they provide a better solution to a specific circumstance, they have to be applied even above the provisions of the constitution. This addition allows that through administrative power and the judiciary, a legal constitutional and now a conventional uh, control, or that is controlled through treaties, can be secured in administrative uh, decisions and judicial decisions. The change that this caused was so radical that now a non-compliance with the international treaty may represent not only liability within Mexico's territory based on our internal laws, but also at the international arena. And we are having now uh, uh, judicial examples of this, this, uh, this uh, uh, non-compliance of our laws internationally. The Supreme Court of the nation ratified this interpretation by stating that international treaties and conventions on human rights do have constitutional rank. So for us right now, as of today, the distinction between soft and hard law is no longer there. And the inaction of the government to implement legislation so that a treaty or convention be applied within our borders is no longer an obstacle to application. For example, Convention 160, 169, uh, it was signed, and then uh, the, this, this article came into being uh, in, in 2011, and the Supreme Court said, well, even though there's no implemented legislation, that obligation is in the treaty. It, it, it goes to human rights, not related to the environment and public participation. Therefore, the, the, the ministers of the Supreme Court drafted a protocol until the legislators drafted a new law that, would, uh, that applies now in Mexico. And that is happening with all the, the, the conventions uh, uh, that Mexico has signed. Uh, I, like, again, I, I come to, to, to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Acharya's uh, 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 comment. The, what, what we are seeing here is that Mexico, uh, because of this very important change in the law, in the constitution, now is applying international law in all of its laws and decision making and in all the discussions be, uh, before the courts. So we are no longer subject to our, our internal, regional uh, 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 understanding of the law. R right now, we are actually applying all the principles that we have signed into, into conventions and treaties. And uh, the following one, I want to give you finally an example. The next one, please. Right now, we are discussing in Mexico, the national waters uh, law, a new national waters law. We had one in place, but now we are substituting it. The bill that introduced, was introduced to the Congress analyzes, it's like a 300 page uh, uh, bill, uh, 45 treaties, conventions, accords, protocols, all related to water. Since the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Pact on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention of Economic and Social and Cultural Rights, etc., the Geneva Convention and all the, and the protocols, the African Charter of Human Rights, the Arab Charter of Human Rights, the Dublin Declaration on Water and Sustainable Development, Rio Agenda 21, all of them, each and every one of them. And from there, we are extracting a new law with new principles that are not in the constitution, but that are in the, in the conventions. The, the, the next one, please. So the new law is not is, is recognizing, defining, explaining, and implementing, for example, these principles, no? the following principles. The prominent principle, which is, is the one in the, in the constitution, but 
for example, the principle of progressivity of environmental law, the, the principle of equity and non-discrimination, the principle of proportionality, the principle of sustainability, the principle of pluricultural recognition and participation, the, the principle of integrality, the principle of prioritization, the precautionary principle, consultation principle, the exhibitability uh, principle, subsidiarity principle, the maximum publicity principle, public participation and accountability, restoration and access to justice and reparation of damages. Each and one of them explained in the law with actions that, be, that can be enforced by the communities, by the individuals, before the, the courts. What has been happening now in Mexico is for the last 10 years, our laws that were very much drafted in terms of uh, the North American laws because of the NAFTA uh, process uh, uh, have, are changing because of this change in the constitution. We are now doing laws that try to, at least, in a, uh, as much as possible, try to implement whatever is in the, legal, in the international arena into laws. When, when, when we are not succeeding there, the courts are, 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 are modifying their, their decisions to uh, establish protocols so that those uh, principles that are not being established in, in our laws are, are followed by the authorities and by the people. So uh, the, next, the next one, please. This is the final one. Uh, um, we, are, we are getting uh, the Mexican laws are getting more broader and complex by the day. And uh, this means that we are turning into a, a very litigious society. Uh, not only we have a complex now uh, uh, decision-making processes, but the discussions in the, before the courts, the administrative courts and the, and the Supreme Court uh, and the state levels and at the federal level are very much complex also, no? Uh, and, uh, and far reaching. Um, which is interesting and, 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 uh, and exciting for us. And, and now we have uh, environmental lawyers uh, all over the place uh, popping out everywhere, no? But that's, that's good, I think. Uh, we still have a lot of challenges, no? We, uh, even though the, the, we are trying to spend in these new laws the, the scope and reach of, of the principles, well, the authorities and the society needs to understand them also, no? Uh, um, the cases before the courts have been more abundant but the judges are still required to be better educated uh, in the way of the new laws, how they will work and how the rights included in them must be secured. And this is also a lengthy, a lengthy process. Uh, final decision makers within the administrations also need to master the new reality to ensure that the rights are protected and harmonized whenever they issue uh, a permit and a license and authorization so that uh, 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 sustainable development uh, for the country can be ensured. So we still have a long way to go, but I think that, uh, that uh, if, if something has been shown during the last years is that environmental law is really a driving force in the justice in Mexico and, uh, and in the way of living. So uh, that is my participation. Thank you so much for, 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 for the time. And I'd be glad to, to ask questions at the end of the, of the event. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Morales, for a thought-provoking presentation. So let's move forward with our next speaker of the session, Ms. Gitari Mitaru. Ms. Elizabeth Gitari Mitaru is an attorney who specializes in environmental and sustainability law practicing areas across East Africa. She believes that law and policy can be used to build an environmentally conscious society that promotes sustainability as well as secures community livelihoods. She has an undergraduate degree in law, a master degree in environmental policy, and currently pursuing her PhD in environmental law. Her research interests are focused on the use of the economic legal tools to achieve environmental sustainability. She also teaches at the Riara University Law School and volunteers her time by serving on different conservation organizations across East Africa. So now I request her to present her thoughts with us. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you uh, very much and I'm um, uh, very happy to be here and it's, it's a wealth of, ex uh, of, of uh, knowledge that we are um, 
gaining. My, my topic today, I want us to um, have a conversation on um, the right to a healthy, uh, to a clean and healthy environment um, and the quest for accelerated development in, in, in Kenya. And perhaps just to give a short introduction, um, my law firm specializes specifically on environmental and sustainability law um, because we, we really do believe that, that law is, is a very good tool to drive um, an, an environmentally conscious society. Um, and those are the areas that we practice in. We are based out of Nairobi and practice across um, East Africa. Um, now, the question then uh, becomes, uh, what exactly are these environmental rights that we're talking about? We had a very good um, introduction at the beginning of this session by uh, Dr. Parik, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. And, and she gave us a, a, a very in-depth um, evolution of international environmental law. Um, and I think it's important to state that um, in addition to what uh, she said, that as early as um, 1972, um, there was thought to be an actual distinct body of <coughs> excuse me, ecological rights that already uh, existed within um, international law. Now, the problem now then becomes how exactly do we define these environmental rights that you're talking about? How do we identify them? How do we identify who within us in society actually holds uh, these like, uh, this rights and of what utility are they to our um, you know, communal existence um, uh, as, as, as a society in a dynamic uh, social context? Um, and if we, if we define a right as um, the freedom to exploit the environment um, adequately but responsibly for long-term survival, then that immediately introduces aspects of other or, or, or i mean other aspects of human existence that must be looked into in tandem with these um, environmental rights and the thing to emphasize here is that when you think about environmental rights immediately there is a dichotomy in terms of procedural environmental rights or procedural environmental law excuse me uh, vis-a-vis -vis substantive uh, environmental law. So procedure, obviously, you, you, you're talking about the how to do things and, and substantive environmental law will be telling you, you know, what, what to do and, 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 uh, and, and clearly uh, alienating the, the sort of the substance of, of exactly, um, you know, the, the environmental regime. Now, to bring it home to Kenya, uh, Kenya is a, is, is described as a developing country. And our previous speaker talked about, had a very good um, uh, uh, synthesis of exactly what the global South means. And, and Kenya would be considered as part and parcel of, of the global South. And now uh, countries in the global South do face a range of serious environmental challenges. Uh, unsustainable utilization, economic development, uh, uh, you know, aspirations, um, the need to meet international uh, international commitments and, and uh, obligations and that, for instance, some of the uh, treaties that uh, Dr. Vera was talking about earlier. Now, um, I'm trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Um, now, natural, if you take just a minute to run through uh, environmental law, natural resource law um, evolution in, in Kenya, uh, governance, environmental law governance in Kenya from the colonial period uh, can be termed as being um, characterized by a very well run system of exploitation and plunder of natural resources. As you can see from, from the screen, you have uh, you know, white men who have, uh, you know, standing next to long taskers, another one with a lion that he has just shot. And, and these are just very few, um, uh, just two examples of, of what it actually meant uh, for, for, for colonialist uh, uh, Kenya, for colonial Kenya in terms of natural resource uh, protection. Now, uh, Colonialism also introduced an aspect that we still have to grapple with, you know, 
50, 60 years um, since independence, which is the policy of fencing off and control of natural resource uh, rich areas as government uh, protected lands. And even more importantly to our conversation on environmental law, the designation of natural resources as belonging to the government. Um, and I'm sure we, we have quite a number of audiences here uh, from with a legal background. And when you start to interrogate this issue of ownership of natural resources, one when, once you introduce property rights and ownership uh, of natural resources to a particular person, the entire bundle of rights then accrues to that particular entity. Um, and when uh, natural resources are owned by the government, it presupposes that the government has the veto vote on what to do with natural resources, whether that is conserve them, um, conserve them or actually plunder them. And now if you juxtapose that with, uh, for instance, um, uh, owned or ownership of natural resources by the citizens of a country or by the citizens of Kenya, there's an introduction of um, a right and a duty of care by the government on behalf of the people of Kenya. And this had actually not, um, happened while, while, uh, while we were still under uh, colonial rule. Now, the other thing that I would like to emphasize uh, while we're still in uh, colonial Kenya is that the legislative and judicial systems as was designed then was uh, designed and structured in such a way that it ensured the profit of a select few, and this would be the colonialists, um, from natural resources, all right? Uh, so you have uh, leg legislation or policies that would uh, criminalize subsistence um, hunting of animals or hunting of animals for food for the African population, but legalize the hunting of animals for, for sports, all right, for the, for the colonialists. Uh, for instance, and this is a very good book uh, uh, by Edward uh, that looks into that particular history. Um, on the right side of the screen, you will see a traditional or a colonial sort of village setting. And one of the key policies that were introduced during the colonial period that uh, consistently continues to impact natural resource government, I mean governance in, in, in the country, is the displacement of uh, Kenyans from their homes um, into non-arable villages, you know, lower down the skips uh, of, of mountains and, and, um, and, and uh, regions across the country to create the so-called white highlands of, of Kenya, where the colonialists and the white settlers would then, you know, settle in and do quite a bit of a very good farming for profit um, as well. Now, all of these things did not really significantly uh, change immediately after independence in 1963. Um, and most policies and laws were carried over from the colonial administration and including environmental law and policies um, in, into the new government, uh, all right? And uh, one can even, uh, you know, say with a, with, with a little bit of caution that in, in a lot of these environmental laws and policies that existed uh, pre-independence, once we got independence in 1963, there was very little editing of changing some of the clauses from, you know, owned by the crown to owned by the government of Kenya. So before all land in Kenya during colonialism, all land in Kenya was owned by the crown or the English crown. And after independence, instead of actually moving on to a more progressive sort of um, uh, right uh, approach to natural resource ownership, uh, the crown aspect of it was replaced with that natural resources were owned uh, by the government of Kenya. Now, post-independence um, uh, and pre-2010, when we got our, our current constitution, um, was characterized, number one, by a very short rule by our founding president, um, Mr. Jomo Kenyatta, who, when he died in uh, 1978 and President Moi then took over for a long dictatorial term of uh, over 20 years. Um, and in as much as there was some you know, uh, slow movement in terms of progressive uh, environmental and legislative uh, um, policies uh, for environment in the country, uh, you know, to I highlight a few, there was a, a law that required uh, a 10 kilometer 
um, radius around natural forests in the country um, to, of, of tea and coffee to protect uh, indigenous forests. There was a lot of um, uh, development aid to support uh, natural forest uh, restoration and conservation across different um, ecosystems in the country. But then there was, because there's, because his rule, President Moy's rule was quite dictatorial in nature. And remember that we are coming from a, a borrowed colonial system where all land in the country is owned by the government of Kenya. And therefore, if you have to own any land, then you have to get a lease from the government for whatever number of years. And when that lease ends, then you have to reapply to the government. And at that time in the 1990s, uh, 80s, 90s, um, you know, the government was synonymous with the president. There was really no uh, distinction in, 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 uh, in, in practice in terms of uh, the office of the president and the three arms of, of government like, uh, um, you know, uh, Dr. Louis actually uh, took us through like happened in Mexico. So um, as you can see from these slides, uh, I don't know whether you're able to recognize this lady this is the first woman, this is the first African woman to win a, a, a Nobel Peace Prize in the world, uh, Professor Wangari Maathai. Um, and she is uh, Kenyan, uh, she was a Kenyan, sorry, she, she passed away a while back. Um, and she did a lot of work in terms of uh, uh, advocacy for natural resource conservation and specifically forests and trees. Um, and the reason I want to discuss her and her work in this particular uh, slide is that uh, in 1989, she sued um, the government through uh, at, you know, the, the then ruling party that used to uh, own a building or wanted to erect a building in one of the green uh, recreational parks in Kenya. Um, and it was the first ever case of such a, a, a a such in the country where you where you found one person going to court to advocate for the rights of the environment and more importantly for the rights of people to a healthy environment and to green spaces where they can actually um, you know uh, sit and recreate and, and so on and so forth so um, unfortunately because of the political uh, climate then you can see her being carried here she was not sick she had just been clobbered uh, by you know the the powers that be, she was beaten you know mercilessly. It's it's a surprise that she did not die at that time, and and unfortunately uh, during this particular landmark case in the country, one of the key questions that was before the court of law was whether a person could actually um, sue on behalf of others or even on her own be uh, on, on her own behalf without actually um, having been caused harm something we call locus standi in law and because obviously of the of the um, uh, political climate uh, she lost that case and the court ruled that one would need locus standi to actually um, institute a private uh, public interest litigation matter um, it also raised critical issues about public participation back in 1989 when we were living in a in a dictatorial regime 1989 was just after the 1985 attempted coup so government control was really really entrenched and here was a woman who was advocating for public participation uh for in, in decision making especially that um affected um, affected um, uh, green spaces. The other thing to highlight during this period, uh, post-independence and before 2010, is that there was an influx of um, environmental sectoral uh, laws and policies. So you would find that each particular sector, forest, water, uh, wildlife, uh, wetlands, so on and so forth, had um, quite a number of specific pieces of legislation that were not at all harmonized. And therefore, if uh, if one wanted to actually uh, answer the question, what are the rights of a citizen of Kenya in regards to water in, in between this period before 2010, excuse me, it would have been quite impossible to actually sift through all of those. I think there were around um, 120 different pieces of legislation specifically on environment, but in different um, sectoral regimes. 
1999, we, we then got the premier, um, uh, what, what, uh, what my previous colleague was calling the omnibus law, which, which is called the Environmental Management and Coordination Act of Kenya. And this uh, law, shortened for EMCA, was actually legislated or formulated as an overarching framework law to guide the implementation um, of, of specific environmental laws. And it was seen as, as the bare minimum standard for all the other sectors to come in. So we had the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, which is still in place until today. It's actually currently undergoing review. Um, and then you would then have stacked on top of EMCA uh, additional now laws specific for specific um, sectors acro across the across the country. Now, uh, in 2010, we finally uh, got our new dawn to use um, Dr. Vera's uh, words again. Um, we got our new constitution. And the 2010 Constitution for Kenya embodied uh, a really monumental change from the past. Uh, remember the history that we've run through in terms of government control, in terms of um, you know, uh, very uh, divergent ways of looking at environmental protection. And in place of a winner takes all constitution before that, or that existed before or system that existed before uh, that had an imperial presidency, like I've said, where you couldn't differentiate between the office of the president and the government. Um, we now had a new, or we now have a new constitution. Well, not so new now, but we, we have a constitution that um, very closely mirrored the American system of constitution uh, of the constitutional system, and included very expansive fundamental rights um, and a very progressive sort of approach to environmental protection. If I can just run through quite a number of uh, these rights, before uh, citizens of Kenya did not have any right to a clean and healthy environment. This constitution specifically provides for uh, the right to a clean and healthy environment. It also included an entire chapter dedicated to uh, natural resource government governance and environmental governance. There's also a very interesting um, provision in terms of the court and the judicial system. Number one, it created a specialized court that would only deal with matters for land and environment. Um, and this ensured that uh, there was, there was uh, number one, specialized um, attention given to, to environment and land matters. And it also catalyzed the market to actually train environmental lawyers and train environmental specialists who would then be able to protect the, the rights that are uh, the environmental rights pro, uh, provided within the constitution. The other key thing that uh, this constitution introduced in respect to the judiciary is a direction to all courts um, when applying a provision of the Bill of Rights, uh, the Constitution directs that the courts should adopt an interpretation that most favors the enforcement of a fundamental freedom, and this would include uh, uh, an environmental right. So it's very also close to, to, to what Mexico has, has as well. Um, the other issue to highlight uh, is the integration of um, sustainable development principles as key principles to support the implementation of the constitution. Um, and also it did away with, with the issue of the local standard that we discussed uh, with the Wangare Mathai incident, where now it is possible for a person in, uh, for instance, Lake Trukana, which is in uh, Northwestern Kenya, uh, to sue uh, the government or to sue anybody else for the protection of the Indian Ocean, which is all the way in the south to the coast of Kenya, a distance of about a, a thousand kilometers away. And they would not need to prove that there is any specific harm that comes to them uh, specifically as a person. Um, and, and I think the other thing to highlight in, in terms of this particular constitution is the recognition of natural resource governance and conservation as a key form of land use. Um, uh, 
you know, as a key form of, of, of the use of land, because before this, uh, any land that was probably left uh, uh, without any physical development, for instance, uh, land where you would have a lot of animals roaming, like in the conservancies in, in Masai Mara in that land was considered idle land uh, because there was no physical sort of development that was that was that was you know visible. Um, and that and, and that has now uh, changed. And I think the last thing to highlight was is 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 the inclusion of um, public public participation. Um, now let's get into the question of environment and development um, in in Kenya and how those two uh, uh, concepts interact. Uh, Perhaps if we start by saying that uh, for a country like Kenya, like we said, it's a, it's a, it's a lower middle income uh, country, economic country, and we are quickly uh, accelerating our growth into a middle income country. Now, what that means is that there's a lot of government policies and pieces of legislation that are being pushed to ensure that um, you know, economic growth is catalyzed. If you look at this particular slide, on the left, uh, these men that you can see are digging the first uh, railway line uh, uh, pre-colonialism uh, around the early 1900s. And on the right-hand side, this is the new standard gauge railway that was being built almost 100 years um, later after, after, after this. Too. So you can see that we are still um, dealing with the same issues, albeit at, at, a, at different uh, lengths. Um, and, and it's important to note that uh, with the development that Kenya is trying to catalyze, there is an influx and there is, there is, uh, uh, there's, a, there, there's increased uh, you know, uptake of international aid and development aid by the country. Um, a lot of this aid uh, can very well be argued that is good in the short term, but when you look at the environmental impacts of what that, um, let me use the word mindless uh, uh, or unplanned and properly unplanned uh, development might have um, into the future. For instance, you have, uh, we have Kenya that has a uh, that has what we are calling the Vision 2030 economic blueprint, which is the economic blueprint for the country with the goal of making it into a middle income economy by the year 2030. Now, Kenya is also a signatory to the uh, China Belt and Railroad uh, Initiative, uh, which has funded quite a number of, of projects in, in the country. Um, there's also the, a current ongoing project called the Lapset Project, which is a, uh, quite, a, how can I put it, an ambitious um, project by, by Kenya, Ethiopia, and Sudan to link the three, and South Sudan, sorry, uh, to link the three um, countries using roads, uh, using bath ports, using crude oil pipelines, all the way from the coast of Mombasa going all the way up to um, Ethiopia and South Sudan. Now, what this means is that there is, high impact of environmental and natural resources as some of these um, um, developments and, and, and infrastructural development projects are taking place. Now, um, most of the, in fact, all of these projects are being funded by development partners, like we said. Uh, some are being funded by China. Others are also being funded by traditional um, development partners like USAID, um, uh, UNEP, uh, the World Bank, so on and so forth. Now, there are some, there's an argument that is postulated that uh, the, the projects that are not funded specifically by China are green in nature. But when you actually have a closer look at some of these uh, projects, one, one of the, in fact, for me, I think the only advantage in terms of environmental governance and, and policy is that most of the uh, traditionally funded projects have environmental safeguards embedded into the contracts, while you don't see a lot of environmental safeguards embedded into uh, development, uh, development aid from the East. Now, there are some unintended 
consequences of some of these green, quote unquote, um, development projects. For instance, there are wind farms that are built up um, and funded by development projects that are causing, um, you know, uh, death and destruction of migratory birds because they're smack in the middle of a, of a migratory um, route. You have hydropower plants that are being set up in national parks in the country um, that affect critical ecosystems. You have, for instance, the standard gauge railway that is traversing uh, a total of uh, more than eight, uh, eight protected areas from the coast all the way up. You know, it goes through Savo National Park, it comes through uh, Nairobi National Park, uh, all the way as it goes up to, to, to Kisumu. You have uh, projects of hydro, um, of high ground falls, uh, fall dams that are actually negatively impacting um, agri agriculture and water use uh, downstream. So all of these things, there's a very, there is a need to look into how exactly law can be used to mitigate some of these impacts of, of, of um, uh, this uh, development. This, this is a hydro power plant within um, a national park uh, in the Rift Valley of Kenya, and you can see some uh, giraffes uh, over there and, and how um, you know, these huge um, structures actually obstruct uh, movement of some of these wild animals. You can see the, this is the standard gauge railway that is traversing through Nairobi National Park and you can see uh, the attitude and the impact it has on, on, on some of um, our wild species. Now, the, the question then becomes how can, um, how can we use, uh, uh, sorry, how can we use environmental law to, to, to mitigate this particular um, situation that we are finding ourselves in. Number one, there's need for clear and easily implementable laws that actually provide um, clarity on rights, duties, um, liabilities, and penalties of all persons involved, of all citizens, of all uh, government entities, uh, so that there's a clear, seamless uh, implementation of these environmental laws. Uh, it's important to note that Kenya is actually considered a leader in terms of quality of environmental protection laws in Africa. And the biggest question that we grapple with is, yes, we have these fantastic environmental laws, but how exactly do we uh, ensure that those laws are actually um, you know, implemented? There is also the need for greater integration of science in environmental public interest litig excuse me, litigation. Um, the, due to the nature of, public, of environmental public interest litigation, there is need to move from procedural issues, for instance, uh, procedural issues to do with uh, participation, public, part, uh, public uh, participation to do with um, you know, the process of conducting an environmental impact assessment to actually litigating before courts and, and allowing courts to give uh, progressive jurisprudence, for instance, on why the standard gauge railway should not go through a critical habitat. Why should we sacrifice a national, um, uh, you know, development project that will have huge monetary uh, contributions to the GDP and the economy in favor of protecting a critical uh, ecosystem. Uh, the other thing that um, is, and, and I think while we're here at environmental public litigation, I want to link it to uh, what, um, excuse me, Ms. Achana talked about and mentioned on climate litigation. And I, I, I do completely agree with her that, that that would be the way to go. Uh, the other issue is adherence to the rule of law. Um, and, and this is, you know, uh, two pronged. Number one, uh, you would find that in some of the projects that I've talked about in the previous slide, there, there is a blanket issuance of permits for government sponsored projects. So when you have the government sponsoring, for instance, a railway all the way from the coast of um, Kenya all the way up to, to northern Kenya, uh, the law requires the environmental, the law that I uh, mentioned earlier, the framework law for environmental management in the country, requires that all projects, whether private or public, must undergo an environmental impact assessment 
uh, before they are actually and, and get an, an environmental impact assessment um, certificate um, before they are actually uh, implemented or started. And you find that the case that we have right now is that when it's a government project, some of these permits are issued without actually interrogating whether there are any environmental um, challenges that would need mitigation or whether, in fact, such a project would have an irreversible environmental impact and it would then therefore be easier not, uh, or better not to go ahead with the project. The other issue in terms of adherence of rule of law is a blunt uh, disregard for court orders. When the standard gauge railway and, and, and a, a number of other roads were being constructed in Nairobi National Park, which is the only park that is within a capital city in the entire world, um, park being you know, in its natural state with uh, wild animals and not, you know, for instance, compared to a zoo. Uh, that is a very huge uh, global heritage that, you know, Kenya should not, um, uh, should ideally take care of in terms of, it can even be regarded as a, as a global common if you, if you, um, you know, it, it is arguable that it can be a global common. Now, oh, you know, quite a number of uh, people challenged that decision to have the railway go, the, go through the Nairobi National Park. And out of, uh, you know, those cases, the court actually issued stop orders to the government not to get uh, the standard gauge railway to go through the National Park. And what we found is that those court orders were disregarded and we currently have, you know, the standard gauge railway going through the National Park. So there's a very in, uh, critical link between environmental law and the rule of law index in a country, because that is the only way. You might have, you know, very good environmental laws and policies, but if there is no rule of law and adherence to um, court orders, then uh, you know it, it's a zero sum game. And um, second, lastly, uh, there is need to move from, I mean, to move to personal culpability and penalization with high maximum custodial sentences for government uh, officials who are actually responsible for this planted disregard of court orders. So that then you have, uh, uh, a, you, you assign personal responsibility to the holder of the government office to ensure that court orders are um, actually um, uh, adhered to. And lastly is the introduction of, um, an ecocentric approach to rights as opposed to what we currently have, which is quite anthropocentric, uh, in terms of moving from looking at nature and natural resources as uh, from, from the purview or perspective of what natural resources can do, uh, can, can help us with their utility or how we can exploit them for our own use as human beings, and actually moving towards assigning rights uh, to nature. Uh, that would allow their protection um, for their own, um, you know, inherent value and intrinsic value as opposed to value uh, derived from their utility to human beings. Uh, so I think I would like to end there by saying that uh, we, we, we have come a, quite a long way from, uh, you know, the turn of the, of the 20th uh, century to now in the 21st century. Um, but I think the, the, the road ahead for, for Kenya and other African nations uh, with similar demographics is um, quite treacherous and there is uh, and greater effort and, and in fact creative innovation is needed uh, so that we can use law as a tool for environmental protection okay, even in the, all of this economic development. So I'd like to end there and thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth, for sharing your excellent presentation. Now, uh, moving on to our next speaker, Mr. Ryan Stoddard. Mr. Ryan holds an LLM in International Law and Sustainable Development and has research topics across environmental law, climate finance, and blockchain. He has since worked alongside governments, municipalities, foundations, and the private sector on sustainable finance projects. He also works with brands across sectors on their sustainability agendas. So over to you, Mr. Stoddart. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm speaking to you from Glasgow, Scotland, sunny Glasgow, um, hosting the COP26 negotiations at the moment. 
Um, I'm not going to be talking too much about that, but I gladly welcome questions at the end if, if you have any. I have been to some of the um, Blue Zone primary meetings and also a large part of COP is actually the fringe meetings on the outside of the formal negotiations, which I have been attending much more frequently. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the plastic crisis specifically and the legislative responses from a UK perspective. And it follows on nicely, actually, from what Elizabeth um, mentioned in, in regards of trying to put implementable, practical solutions on the ground that actually get us towards some of these overarching principles and ambitions. And I'd also like to just echo my gratitude to the organisers, to, uh, to Nanoland for organising such an international event. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of it and seeing that it's so well attended. So the global plastic crisis, clearly it's something that affects all of us. Um, sorry, I'm just moving this on my screen. Sorry, I'm getting some things in the way. There we go. So although it's a global plastic crisis and we've all seen the great specific garbage patch and waste from one country ends up far, far afield, not all crises are created equally. We're all aware of that um, from a range of environmental crises, crises, but particularly plastic crisis from a UK perspective is something that we need to take much more ownership over. So there's over 8 billion drinks containers not recycled in the UK each year. That's either going to landfill or incinerated. And as a country, we have the most plastic waste per person in the world after the US. So clearly, it's something that we should be contributing far more to and that there should be tighter regulation on and um, some sort of restriction on us creating so much waste. What are we doing? So I'm going to look at two specific pieces of legislation that are coming in across the UK. Deposit return schemes. So that's the uh, carrot in this instance. So that's an incentive scheme to try and reduce plastic waste and increase recycling. And then extended producer responsibility, which is the stick. So that is trying to discourage poor behavior um, and reduce the amount of waste that is being created. For those of you who don't know, a deposit return scheme is quite a simple mechanism in reality once it's set up. Um, conceptually, it's quite simple. So you purchase a product that's in a container. As part of that price, there is a fee attached that is returnable to you. It is a deposit. Once you return the, the container, you're repaid that fee. It primarily targets glass, cans, and plastic. You can see there the image of a reverse vending machine. What normally happens is they're placed in supermarkets or, um, or communal areas where people can then return their plastic. It's actually a very interesting scheme in terms of what it does to that plastic um, from an economic perspective, because it basically gives value to litter. And what you have seen in uh, jurisdictions where this has been implemented for a long time is that people of a low economic opportunity, particularly homeless communities, see this as a resource. It, obviously, it's not a solution for for that crisis at all and it's not meant to be and that's not why it's enforced but it's interesting to see how something that is waste by attaching some value to it becomes valuable so you see that homeless communities collect the litter and because it's got an economic value they return it and then they receive that economic benefit which currently there is no economic benefit to and it's quite a traditional um economic philosophy that if you attach value to it people see the value in it and it also means that there's an incentive to clear up litter, which is really an unintended um, positive, but a positive nonetheless. So within the UK, uh, it's quite a complicated system at the moment for deposit return schemes. So if, you, if you're not aware of the constitution in the UK, there is the UK government, which is Westminster, which is also England's national government. And then there's devolved government. So Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland all have their own parliament and their own national government. England, Wales and Northern Ireland are working together on this deposit return scheme initiative. 
and it's estimated that that's going to come out in 2024, although that may move. Um, and the findings are due to be released. They were already due to be released, but it's been delayed, as these things always are. So we're still waiting on the outcome of that. Scotland moved slightly faster, and Scotland in general politically is trying to push themselves to be, promote themselves as being more environmental and more progressive than the UK. So there's a slight bit of politicising, I would suggest, to why Scotland's pushed forward um, ahead of the rest of the UK. And that was actually meant to be implemented last year, but due to the pandemic, it was delayed till 2022. So it was due to be implemented this year, but it was delayed to 2022. And actually, it is now looking like it's going to be delayed again till March uh, 2023, probably more like October 2023. Part of the issue with that is the potential complexity added in to having different deposit return schemes in Scotland in comparison to the other three UK nations. So although they're national governments, there's no borders between our countries. There's no difference normally in, in rules for goods, for example. So um, you normally trade completely openly as if it's one country, whereas this deposit return scheme could add in some distinctions that make things slightly more complex for both the public, the consumer and for businesses. So in Scotland, it's going to cover PET plastic bottles, glass, steel or aluminium cans. And I should say, this is just for drinks containers. You know, it could be um, broader than that. In, in, in some countries, it, it is broader than that. But for this, it is just... Um, sorry, I'm just looking at the questions there. Can everyone else hear my voice clearly? Seeing one person can. So in Scotland, it is just... Uh, for drinks containers, but it is a quite an open, um, it's quite a broad deposit return scheme. So it's from 50 millilitres containers to three litres containers. And that means that basically all um, drinks containers are covered within it. That is in contrast to what has been proposed in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So it, as I said, it's only out for consultation at the moment. We don't know what the findings of that consultation are, but they've got two models being proposed. So they have the on-the-go model and the all-in model. So the on-the-go model has an upper limit of 750 milliliters. So that's basically trying to capture um, all of those 500 milliliter, the, the type of bottle that you get in a supermarket, all your favorite brands, Coca-Cola, Sprite, et cetera, which is, one of the most widely used plastic containers. So the thought being, and this is the argument for the on-the-go model, that 85% of littered plastic bottles are 500 milliliters, so it would capture those. That's the type of bottle that you have on the go that you'd normally throw in the bin or litter. So that's the type of bottle that should be within this scheme to incentivize people to then take it to a supermarket as they're walking along the street, collect their deposit back, and then it's recycled. The all-in model would be far broader and um, potentially simpler. And the argument is that actually anything from 750 milliliters to three liters is already collected at home and is already, um, is already taken into the recycling waste stream through curbside collection. I would argue that simplicity is key. And we've seen that in the UK in particular over the pandemic that political and policy messaging, if it's not really simple, it's really hard to get by and having the complexity of an on the go model and then also home collection, I think, could lead to quite little impact. Maybe simpler for, um, for users if all containers were uh, integrated into it. That would also reduce complexity for consumers across the UK because there would be one system. So it would be much clearer for consumers to understand because they would just be looking at basically one deposit return scheme and also for businesses. So as I said, businesses don't operate distinctly from these countries normally. So if they had to apply, if they had to abide by different detailed regulation, it would add an extra level of complexity for their compliance and also potentially for their business operations. So if you think that there may be then requirements for different labeling, for example, or different messaging to different markets, then they're going to have to deal with those markets differently. And it's suggested that if they are different, that actually could 
limit Scotland's participation in some of these markets because England, a, a small English producer may not want to go to the lengths of creating a different label for a Scottish market if it's not that big for them. So it may reduce consumer choice in the end. Now, it's not a new thing, deposit return schemes. It's not a new um, policy approach legislation. And the UK are by no means leaders in this. Canada actually enacted the, the first deposit return scheme in 1970 in British Columbia, and it's in 10 Canadian provinces, which is actually um, of, almost all of them. I think there's 13 in total. And it's in 10 US states who are, who are not great recyclers, <laughs> to be honest. So it's quite encouraging that they're starting to take action to, to make some of this um, easier for consumers on the ground to participate in recycling. Within the EU and EFTA, it's a very well-developed system. So Norway has 97% recycling rates for plastic bottles. Germany is above 90% frequently. I think Sweden's 95%. There's a further 19 EU countries legislating and consulting on this. And there's only three countries in the EU that have not actually started to consider a deposit return scheme. So although the UK is pushing forward with this, it's actually in line with, with other territories um, with similar sort of uh, economic and development status and also similar, broadly similar legal frameworks. But does this really solve the problem? Um, so a lot of my work is actually working at this sort of nexus between private sector and legislation. Clearly, this legislation is trying to implement some of our overarching environmental targets and adhering with international um, policy. But is that enough to say that we've done it? It obviously looks good and it seems like we're making progress. For aluminium, there could be an argument made for it being quite an effective system. Our aluminium is infinitely recyclable. It uses 95% less energy to recycle an aluminium can than to create a new aluminium can and it can be back on the shelf in 60 days approximately. Um, but there's still a lot of energy used to recycle it and also some virgin aluminium is still used each time. Glass is a very heavy material. So just as a packaging material in general, I'm not sure it's something that we should be actually encouraging to increase in, in our waste stream. And it is, so there's a large carbon footprint for um, transporting it. There's also quite a lot of energy involved with recycling it. And there isn't, I mean, there's other schemes and systems in place where you could actually just return glass bottles and not have to recycle them. You could just reuse them. For plastic, I would argue that it is really quite ineffective. Plastic bottles can only be recycled two or three times. The polymer fiber length is, um, is reduced by quite a considerable amount on each recycle. So it ends up not being um an effective plastic for bottles after the second third time and it ends up going into a different waste stream and basically my, my view on this is instead of trying to create a system to deal with the waste we should be trying to encourage systems that don't create as much waste we're actually just looking at marginal gains here in effect um and not really encouraging producers and businesses who are the creators of this waste to change their model. We're just saying we've got a different way of dealing with it. Um, and, and quite a lot of that then gets put onto the consumer. And there's, there's a lot of literature out there about how deliberate the ownership of environmental harms, how deliberate the transfer of ownership of environmental harms to individuals has been from business. And I, I think that we should be trying to disrupt that rather than incentivizing it. And that takes me nicely on to my next point on extended producer responsibility. So I've got a little infographic at the top there. Um, and I would really like and encourage anyone listening or these fellow speakers to just type in the chat what they think that infographic represents. And I'll come to that in a moment. So extended producer responsibility, basically it's trying to place the responsibility for the end of life management of packaging products on the producers rather than 
on the end consumer. So exactly what I was just saying as a criticism of deposit return scheme, EPR is, is a potential response that uh, negates that. And effectively it's a tax on the harm that packaging or products will cause at the end of life of their use. So it incentivizes producers to prevent waste creation because they're going to be taxed on that and that assessment's made at the, the, the point of sale. It promotes better product design because they, they obviously will be designing it to reduce that tax cost at the end and supports um, recycling because there is an encouragement through EPR to get product, get packaging and products into the waste stream and get them recycled. And the way that that happens is basically through modulated fees. So you get a reduction. This um, sort of ties in with the circular economy. This is the sort of cycle for EPR. You want better product design manufacture. You want less virgin materials. There's modulated fees in response to that. So if you've got more virgin material in your product, then you'd have a higher tax basically on that product. If you use more recycled material, then you would have a lower fee. Similarly, if you're trying to instill reuse and refill systems into your product use, then you'll have a lower end of life tax. The point I was making about the recycling targets, if there is really comprehensive labeling or encouragement for users to discard their products responsibly and get it into the waste stream, then there is also a reduced fee. And that can be as broad as uh, as part of sort of PR marketing. So it's not just on the product itself, it's encouraging them to support campaigns more broadly. And then your tax on residual waste or exporting of waste. And as I said, if you use more recycled material rather than virgin material, then you've also got a benefit there. So that is something that's happening in the UK. Um, we're not as far forward as the deposit return scheme. The consultation is still ongoing. Uh, so the DRS consultation in England, Wales, Northern Ireland is actually has finished, but they've not published results. This consultation is ongoing and it's a four country approach. So it is Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England. So it's a simpler methodology. And I think some of that is has been pushed politically because it's become quite clear that actually it's to be more complicated to have a um, asymmetrical deposit return scheme system. So that's looking to broadly the full scope of EPR in the UK. And that's the government going out to industry bodies, going out to the public sector, um, speaking to third sector scientists, um, etc., about how EPR should be shaped within the UK to be most effective. And there's always going to be a sort of tension between uh, business and then also environmentalists uh, and scientists, largely, and then government. So it, it's quite a fraught negotiation um, and obviously conflicting interests as part of that. But essentially, the point of it is we're trying to encourage private sector companies to design their products either for disassembly or reuse or to use more. Um, sustainable materials, use waste streams, to use recycled materials, and better waste reduction strategies, and also encourage end consumers to dispose of their products more responsibly. It's, it's really important in Scotland in particular, 74% of our carbon footprint is actually from goods and packaging and the services that we consume. So if we can reduce the amount of materials that are going into that, particularly raw um, virgin materials, then it'll substantially lower our carbon emission, it'll protect habitats, biodiversity, and our overarching environmental ambition. So that although it seems like quite a private sector um, business focused piece of legislation, it's obviously very tied to overarching environmental principles and aims. So the findings that are due to be made later this year um, and it's expected that it would raise between one and two billion pounds per year from producers for the costs of disposing of their, of their goods. So although it's also trying to encourage it, um, to encourage better design, there is also then a benefit because the disposal of those products that cannot be 
uh, reused, which there is always going to be. There is always going to be a waste stream, although we should be trying to limit it. The cost of it is no longer going to be on government, taxpayers, and individuals to pay for it. It's actually on the producers themselves. They're going to have to pay to deal with the, their own mess effectively. Now, again, it's not like the UK is leading the way on this. It's not something we've invented. Um, it's been pretty prominent in the OECD for a number of years, and particularly within the EU. And they're actually going to try and expand it. So in the UK, that's actually really focused on packaging only, although there's discussions about moving it to a broader system and there's other pieces of legislation about producer responsibility for other products, but that piece in particular is focused on packaging. Whereas in the OCD, they're talking about bulky items such as mattresses, textiles, um, e-waste, tires, fishing gear. In Canada, it's been active for a number of decades for packaging. And interestingly, in the US, there's been a move towards it. So Maine enacted their first extended producer responsibility this year, which is quite a big move because obviously it is quite a libertarian, small government country. So to, and also very pro-business to, to put that responsibility on businesses is quite a big shift that is being discussed in other Northeast, more liberal states. So we could see some impact there, which would be significant because of the amount of waste that the, the US creates. So does this really solve the problem? Well, my criticism of DRS was that it just deals with the waste that's created and, and that we're looking at the waste after the fact, in effect, and we should be proactively trying to discourage waste from the get-go. And I think that this has a much better opportunity to, to reduce that. So we're seeing things like um, bioplastics, biodegradable bioplastics or compostable bioplastics, uh, packaging made from food waste, new models, new circular models for purchasing goods like refill and reuse, much more disassembly for, um, for reuse of component parts and modular design. Uh, and I do think this has got a much better chance of accelerating us towards a circular economy where things are reused and repaired rather than disposed of or recycled and constantly following down that value chain. This has a better opportunity of keeping us higher up in in the loop so i welcome anyone to, to ask any questions at the end of this whether that be about my presentation or if you've got any questions about what cop's been like i'd also be happy to answer those thank you very much mr stoddard that was an amazing presentation i would like to add that our next speaker mr nazifo yona Chope, couldn't be able to join with us due to some emergency work so let's move forward so now we have been listening to our eminent speakers deliberating in the areas of environmental law since the last evening. All these valuable insights gave us a new perspective that one should adopt in their practice. Encouragement, enthusiasm, excellency is the major aspect of this webinar. Now coming to the question and answer session of this event, I now request to our patient listening audience to put forward their questions before our esteemed speakers for the desired answer. So our first question is for Mr. RDM Shah. Uh, is net zero emissions possible? Are we well versed with renewable resources to such an extent that we can totally shift to renewable resources? Oh, thank you. I mean, according to the IPCC and also the UNFCCC, uh, net zero emissions uh, is indeed uh, feasible, um, albeit uh, you need to have um, quite significant investment in terms of technology, in terms of uh, transformations of uh, sectors uh, that are currently based on fossil fuels to renewable energy, uh, and also uh, transforming uh, the agri uh, and forestry and land-based sectors uh, quite significantly from, let's say, depending so much on converting forests to agriculture to uh, improving the productivity on existing lands. So it is uh, quite possible, uh, but it is uh, going to have uh, significant challenges in terms of getting the investment, getting the finance, getting the technology right. And I think in Glasgow right now, um, uh, people and also uh, leaders have already uh, uh, discussed and debated the significant gaps in terms of uh, 
um, the finance. I mean, the promise of one hundred billion dollars. I think it, it's still far away from uh, achieving or, or getting to that kind of numbers. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Stoddard. Can plastic boots boots help in the climate change? Yeah, there's certainly a large carbon footprint to plastic use and to to waste in general. Um, I do think that that it gets conflated slightly, often as being um, policies directed towards plastic still being a climate change policy. Whereas I think that really the the major harm of plastic is plastic pollution itself. There is then definitely a large carbon footprint for plastic use. There's no doubt that we should be moving away from that for climate change purposes as well. And I would argue that that is part of the problem with risk with the recycling scheme for plastic that is a very inefficient recycling scheme. So actually it's a really ineffective product for packaging or for material use in a lot of cases, if it's going to have to go through a recycling loop because it's, there's energy attached to utilizing plastic and then also recycling it. And it is going to end up mm-hmm. as a waste stream that we can't use. So yeah, there definitely is um, climate change benefits from tackling plastic. But I think the greater good is for um, limiting its use for plastic pollution itself. May I add something? Please do. May I add something? Yes, sir. So as, as far as plastic is concerned, whether it creates a uh, pollution or something on climate change. It is said like that. But you know that I found very recently that from the waste of the plastics, they are making the tiles. It is very useful. And moreover, plastic is very light material, so it is spread in our roadside or so everywhere. It looks that it is very big poly pollutants, but if you gather all these plastic bags, very low, very small things, and many Indian companies started making tiles of this plastic. So, I if you burn it. It creates some gases which is not good. But if it is collected properly, then it doesn't occupy much space. It doesn't remain uh, affecting any climate. That is what I think about that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is open for every panelist. Do you think the uh, judicial system in the countries are well versed with the environmental laws or there is a need to create awareness for better implementation of the existing laws? Uh, As far as India is concerned, I can say because in India we have a national green tribunal, a separate body which takes care of uh, the uh, environment related issues. Earlier we were not having it, but then later on it came into existence. Uh, from 2010, we have a separate tribunal. And still, we can go to Supreme Court also. So, the option is there. Even the trial court. So, number of forums are available. Uh, in other courts, I, I can say that uh, that, that facility uh, or that uh, particular awareness or anything which may... Which I cannot speak with, uh, with assurance that everyone will be well-versed with it. But uh, National Green Tribunal is a specific body. And a similar kind of setup uh, may be existing in some other countries, but India is having that. And if you see uh, the other countries also, even there is a huge uh, climate education also. So uh, I think judicial system is now uh, well aware of uh, the environment related issues. Thank you, ma'am, for your valuable insight. Another question for Dr. Morales. Uh, are climate goals within reach still? And how can CO2 be measured? And will a carbon border tax really work? Well, we, we have been using uh, and implementing uh, tax carbons uh, uh, 
or, or tax on carbon uh, 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 emissions for a while now. Um, I, I'm not sure that they, that, they, that they work that much. You need a lot of, uh, first, you need a, uh, 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 some authority that would enforce that, no? And then uh, a, a regulated community that will be willing to, comp to, to take advantage or, or, or to, or to, or, or, or to uh, register their, their emissions. So uh, um, then you have the problem that uh, you don't have the same uh, quality of the authorities and the same uh, uh, level of, 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 of surveillance in each uh, of the states, no? So you have a very, a very different uh, situation between North and South, no? Uh, it's much likely that the Northern part of the country, which is very much closer to the US and that share the same standards because of the manufacturing, uh, um, uh, the manufacturing uh, 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 links that, that we have with the US, they do comply because uh, the, the, the companies in the US would, uh, would require hours to comply with every single uh, norm, including uh, 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 this kind of taxes. But in the South, it's, it's totally different, no? Because we don't have that many uh, 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 chains of, of, of production that will be linked there. So I don't think that, um, that, uh, that even if we have it in the law, we would be, uh, 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 it would be very effective at this stage in Mexico. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, in the question answer session, what would be the impact of environmental law in economic growth and poverty reduction globally? And how can we make people aware about the environmental laws as there are very few? Oh, I, I can see, I don't, I, don't, I don't think I can see that from my end. I can see what would be the impact of environmental law in economic growth and yeah. poverty reduction globally. I think maybe to, to answer that one, um, the environmental law for me is an inter, it, it has to be looked at from an interdisciplinary perspective, that you cannot have environmental law outside of any interlink, in, interlinkages with any other um, sectors of the economy. Um, and therefore, it's very critical that in the, in the formulation of environmental laws, and in the implementation of environmental laws, there is always uh, the link to other sectors. Because when you talk about natural resources, uh, for instance, let's take the example of wildlife. You have a wildlife law that is an environmental law, but that wildlife has you know, uh, economic uh, benefits through probably say something like tourism, and therefore it's attracting um, uh, tourism dollars into, into the economy. When you think about uh, forest and payment for ecosystem services and the money that uh, the government or, or a country can earn from payment for ecosystem services. So I do think that it is um, critical that environmental law is embedded and is and is thought of as a multidisciplinary sort of, uh, um, from a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, and this would then uh, catalyze economic uh, growth and, and, and poverty reduction. Thank you, Ms. Gitari Mitaru. Another question for Mr. Ryan Stoddard. Considering that UK is one of the largest plastic waste generator, what percentage of it can be eliminated by GRS and EPR by 2030? And uh, how does e-waste contribute to climate change? Uh, so in terms of GRS and EPR, reducing plastic waste, it's hard to put a number on that. I would say that DRS on its own wouldn't necessarily reduce the amount of plastic waste that considerably because there is always going to be um, virgin plastic required for use if, if we're just recycling plastic because you can't recycle plastic over and over again because it degrades in quality. So we would still need to have more plastic and um, to shift that we actually need to be using less plastic as packaging and looking at other materials and other models if we really want to reduce the amount of plastic waste that we're creating. So I think a strong EPR tied in line with the, DR, with the, with the DRS systems could have a significant impact, but it's really more about extended producer responsibility, in my opinion, um, and a strong EPR rule that actually encourages, in a significant way, producers to move away from plastic and, and look at other um, forms of 
either business operations or other materials. And then your other question was on e-waste. Yeah, well, I mean, the massive problem with e-waste is the amount of embodied carbon in creating new products. So to create a new product, and particularly with big brands that try and sell you a new electronic item every year that's got a slight upgrade, the, the huge amount of embodied carbon in creating each of those products is a massive factor in, in climate change. Um, and again, it comes just down to us wasting products and wasting goods and resources. Um, and that is where the massive impact on the climate is. Thank you, sir. I once again thank you our delegated panelists and also attendees for making this session as very interactive. So let's move forward. I now request Mr. Zarnesh Kanujia to address this gathering with his vote of thanks. Mr. Zarnesh works as a chief climate analyst at Nanoland Limited. He is a postgraduate in climate change impacts management from School of Science, Gujarat University. He mainly focuses on research generally associated with climate geography, biodiversity, glaciers, and climatic wildlife. He is also a filmmaker, a wildlife photographer, and a nature lover. I now request Mr. Zarnesh Kanojia to deliver a vote of thanks. Over to you, Mr. Zarnesh. Uh, thank you, Janashi. Uh, so good evening, everyone. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I am Zarnesh Kanojia and I work as a Chief Climate Analyst at Ireland. Uh, I am honored to present the word of thanks for today's international webinar on behalf of Ireland and the entire fraternity of this organization. Firstly, I am thankful to Dr. Madhuri Parekh, Director and Dean at the Institute of Law, Nirma University, for taking out some precious time out of our busy schedule and participating in this international webinar as a chief guest and giving such valuable insights about environmental law. You are much obliged, ma'am. I extend my hearty gratitude to all our speakers for wasting this for wasting the important work and sharing with us their research and opinions today on environmental law, principles, and policies of different countries. I want to extend my gratitude to Dr. Rajesh Kumar Acharya, our chief scientific advisor at Nanolab for welcoming our speakers and organizing this webinar at such an accomplished level. Dr. Acharya has always dreamt to come with, this, uh, come with some exemplary ideas which benefit the society. His vision and dream has always helped Nanoland to become what it is today, coming out with such a savvy idea to educate people about climate change and biodiversity was obviously a reverent decision. Uh, I would like to extend my appreciation to Ms. Archana Fukan. Uh, Mr. Fitria Adinshya, um, Dr. Luis Vera Morales, Ms. Elizabeth Gitari Mitaru, and Mr. Ryan Stoddart. We have been fortunate to have a renowned identity from academics, industry, and other areas. And I would like to I would like to take this opportunity to place on record a hearty thanks to Xavier Research Foundation, LD College of Engineering, University School of Law, Gujarat University, US India Importers Council. Verain Associates, Sakitan Consulting, Center for Excellence in Environment and Forest Law, ICFI Law School, Hyderabad, and Institute of Law, Nirmal University for co-organizing this international webinar and making it a success. We are grateful to Waste Nature, Razor Aqua, EM Corp, Rotary Club of Ahmedabad Elite, and HK India for sponsoring this event. I take this occurrence to thank the entire committee as well as the audience for representing their value of views and without whom this webinar would not have been possible. Taking everything into account, I should thank all of the individuals who have upheld us directly or indirectly in the smooth working of this webinar till the end. We have planned such interesting webinars in the future too, where we need your full participation. Thank you, everyone. This is much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. In closing, thank you very much. Zarnesh, in closing, I wish to express my gratitude to all the panelists and participants for the full cooperation. It offers me a chance to commemorate our success in pursuing excellence in the field of environment and law. We are privileged to have in attendance such distinguished experts as well as observers and having such resourceful and knowledgeable researchers who have helped us to gain insight about our law in safeguarding the environment. With this, we sum up our session and wish everyone to stay home and stay safe. Thank you for, for joining, joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Parikh and the galaxy of the speakers. Thank you, all of you, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.
Bye. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.